Hey everybody, welcome back to Terminus, the blue velvet of extreme metal podcasts. I am the death metal guy, aka behemoth branded asthma inhaler. And I am the black metal guy, aka, uh, let's see, uh, Watan branded asthma. <laughs> I've, I've, so, uh, su- I've supposedly seen a- Watain like three times, but I've always just left and gotten pizza during their sets. I saw them when I was a little young and naive, so I actually, I think I paid to see them. Um, but, um, uh, and I actually missed almost every band, but I'm always late to everything, as you know. So I, uh, <laughs> I missed most of Goat Horror, which was a shame. Uh, but, uh, go, I just saw the end of the set and I was like, well, damn, yeah, go, or is great. Uh, but, um, Watain, this was, I think it was right as they put, they put out Lawless Darkness, but they were still playing a lot of songs from before that. Yeah. And like, again, as, as I've said, I think, although they're obviously full of shit, I think that up to that point, they had been a pretty solid arena black metal band. And so it was a good show. It was just I, big I and theatrical and. I think Somebody this... tried to get on the stage and the bassist just kicked him off. Well, that's cool. I, I think at this yeah. point, I, I think at this point in my career, so to speak, Watain is my most hated black metal band. <laughs> like, like, I kind of, I know, I kind of agree. Like, if I see someone, um, if someone is like, uh, I don't know, we just started an Instagram and like, you know, there are these accounts that are, there are these like weird, ge- generic black metal accounts. Yeah. And, you know, they'll like follow you or whatever and they'll post pictures of Watain. And it's like, <laughs> surely you're a bot. <laughs> it's, um... All right. So, so, uh, so, <laughs> how, so <laughs> speak... surely you're Eric Danielson. <laughs> yeah. All five foot two of him, you know. Yeah. The, the, the counter to tiny black metal vocalists being cool guys. <laughs> True, he's the anti-Danny Phil. I was about to say he's the exact opposite of Danny Phil, of five foot two yes, and at, full of love. At Valhalla, yeah. they'll meet. At Valhalla, they'll meet on the field, um, <laughs> and and the true one will survive. Or I mean, at Ragnarok. Sorry, uh, <laughs> Ragnarok. They'll meet on the field. Um, okay, so speaking of which, uh, housekeeping. So we've got the IG up, and uh, you're handling that one. So I am indeed, and it's been a it's been a cool week. I, I mean. IG is turns out to be as everyone told me. Uh, uh, the um, it's really good for signal boost, and, and we got a lot of positive response. Um, our our bud in heretical sect, uh, who we're going to be doing some um, promo cycle stuff for coming up. We're going to do a premiere and a review, and eventually an interview, like a real fucking website. Look thing. at us, uh, Jesus. Yeah, look at us. Um, so very, very cool of him to uh, go through us for that. Uh, and he just did a, a very generous post for uh, on our behalf on Instagram. So I thought I'd, I'd read it because it's a nice review. Uh, <laughs> um, Terminus Extreme Metal is a new podcast by our friends that brings in-depth weekly reviews of Black and Death Metal. Okay, if you're listening, you already know that. Their reviews are brutal, considerate, and knowledgeable. Never pulling punches, Terminus seems set on destroying your idols under the fist of journalistic integrity. <laughs> they may be dropping the hammer on heretical sect in the coming months. So subscribe now in anticipation uh, uh, yeah, subscribe now in anticipation of our coming doom and critical dissection. Well, <laughs> that's <laughs> like very, I, it's very kind. I don't feel like we're that mean, but you know. <laughs> yeah, I think we were just saying before uh, before we got on air. It's like, yeah, we're not that mean, but just compared to the fluff on all the fucking blogs, we're yeah. I, got, mean I guess because, if you're just looking at like metal injection and stuff, yeah, we're we're brutal. Yeah. <laughs> we we want the music to be better. So we like to uh, we like to try to um, get those constructive criticisms in there. Oh yeah, it's like uh, it's like we were saying. It's like when you talk to your your buddy who you've known a bunch, and uh, he's in a band and he wants to show you a demo track. You're like, this part's good, this part's good, this part kind of sucks. Uh, tighten up the drumming a little bit here and there, and yeah, you kind of got something going, you know? Like <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like if yeah, if if we really hate a band, we almost never review it on here. And the times when we with the times when we pan something, it's turned out to be mainstream stuff that we've had maybe some hope would be interesting, yeah. or at least 
and at least an interesting example. And, and we've we've really basically decided to just stop doing this that kind of thing at this yeah. point, just because we're tired of it. So um, yeah, if you want to hear us really really drop the hammer on something, listen to the incantation review from two weeks oh, ago. God, it fucking sucked. Mm. <laughs> so uh, all right, quick, so let's uh, replug our uh, like last week. We finally got our Patreon and subscribe stars up, and uh, we got our first couple patrons already. So thank you to those guys and. Uh, the, I mean, they've uh, they donated at absurdly high tiers, so the standard's been set. People, if you if yeah, you we've I, already got a war metal barbarian werewolf overlord, as well as an art metal arch autist. Those yes, are some of our tiers. So, uh, I mean, if you're if you're not donating at at least the twenty dollar level, please don't waste my time. <laughs> yeah. So. But yeah, no. So thank I think, you. I think I think Rest from Leviathan just followed our Instagram. I can't remember if I followed him or he followed us. But yeah, if you're Rest, you should uh, donate at the Danny Filth tier. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so. and I, I won't talk shit about Leviathan anymore. I'll be like, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, he's cool though. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, thank you so much to those guys. And obviously, as we've been talking about on the show, we love doing the show. We do put a lot of time and effort into it. Basically, you know, like m- close to full time job. Honestly, at this point, honestly, yeah, yeah it's, it's it's getting. Yeah, you know, we're gonna have to find a way to do it faster. Yeah. Uh, so, but, um, but uh, anything you guys can contribute helps. I mean, you know, we've got uh, smaller tiers like three or five dollars. Three, the three dollar tier, crust punk grifter. <laughs> the, uh, five, do- which gets you access to all the extra content at Terminus Prime. We've got, uh, and we've got a, the just, just higher tier at $5, Black Metal Hermit, which, uh, gets you access to the Discord, and you get your nifty Discord title. Uh, Proletarian Death Metal Bro at $10. Uh, and then we get up to Art Metal Arch Autist, War Metal Barbarian Werewolf Overlord, uh, and you are literally Danny Phil at $50. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I mean, if you guys enjoy this content and you want to hear more of it, we're doing these bonus episodes. Uh, response to them has been great so far. So, uh, yeah, just uh, if you're into it, see if you can chuck us a few bucks a month and uh, we'll keep providing more we, autism for you. <laughs> we, we'd love to. Okay, and uh, do you want to just get into the rundown? Uh, r- well, real quick, what's the uh, what's the URL for the IG? Oh, yeah, for sure. I think we are just, um, Terminus, God, I'm still learning the ropes on this thing, but, um, I think we are just Terminus Extreme Metal Podcast, all, and the, oh, and the handle is Terminus Extreme Metal. I did okay. that podcast on the app. Yeah, you should fine. be able to follow us, uh, find us. Um, and, uh, I will, I've just got a couple pretty standard posts up, but the hope is over time to start adding things like, you know, weird pictures of trees and you know like dead deer and shit yeah. like that and if you're uh if you're if you're not with the ig crew if you're a true slam overlord like uh my side of the podcast you can check us out on <laughs> facebook at terminus podcast for uh you know we i post all the new episodes do random shit posting and i'll probably just start uh sharing some cool underground music as well just to talk about oh, things that we, that. Didn't, that we yeah. didn't get around to on the podcast but yeah. uh there's some extremely high quality shit posting on there, and um, <laughs> I would love to see more fan engagement on Facebook. Definitely. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, let's get to the rundown. So, uh, f- first couple records of the day are mine. So, we're going to be opening up with the new Macabre Omen, uh, Anamnesis, uh, out on uh, Vaughn Records, who are, I would say, probably one of the top three underground black metal labels nowadays. Vaughn is. Just... I would say, yeah, as, as far as far as stuff that's up there on the level with like Profound Lore or Twenty Bucks Spin or whatever, like in that tier of almost mainstream, Vaughn is like one of the best and most consistent, right? Yeah, there's they basically don't release anything I dislike, which is a, a hard a hard thing to pull off, but uh legendary German label at this point. I've been into them since they first started like 10 years ago or something. They've become much bigger. Yeah, same, I guess. Very yeah. deservedly. <clears throat> and uh, of course, Macabre Omen uh we're going to get into them, but if you want to start establishing a Terminus canon, Macabre Omen is definitely there as a band that you need to definitely listen to. Definitely as far as just exactly in the middle of the Venn diagram of our tastes. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. 
so after that, we get something that's more decidedly in, in my realm. Uh, we've got a Colombian brutal death metal band, which is Niall Obstat, with their new record, uh, Antimatter, on Rotting Cemetery Records, who I'm not too familiar with. I think they're a South American, I think they're a Chilean label. I think label. it's Rotten Cemetery. It oh, is it Rotten? Time, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, Rotten Cemetery Records. Yeah, Chilean brutal death label. Uh, I'm not too familiar, but... You know, this is a promising, uh, promising first thing I'm hearing from them, so I'll be checking back with them in the future. And uh, what have you got today? Uh, let's see. First, we've got a fan submission of sorts. Um, I found an interesting Slavic black metal band on Bandcamp that's already got a little bit of micro buzz from some people. Uh, it's and I this band is called Ikotka, uh, and the album is called. Let's see. It's uh, Zagovor, but which means charm. But they're all, all it's all written in Cyrillic. They've got translations for you. Yeah, uh, we're gonna be we're going to be and, reading song titles in the English translations because yeah. we can't read Cyrillic. So <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and the uh, the CD version is by Sound Age Productions, which I haven't heard of. But um, it's a it's like are, a regional Russian label. They don't get overseas a whole lot. Huh. Nice. Okay. And the release is basically self-released online on Bandcamp. This is, uh, really, yeah, it's, it sort of, it really struck me. And when I followed the band, uh, I don't know if this is because I say I've got a podcast in my profile, which is Hellhammer666 on Bandcamp, <laughs> um, or if it's just, they're just doing it for some or all of the people who follow them right now. But they sent me a, uh, they sent me a, uh, download code with a very nice message. I was like, well, this is cool. And I listened to the whole thing, even without meaning to, and really liked it. So cheers to those guys for the download code, and we're going to give your record the full treatment on the show today. Um, last one is also kind of a regional thing. This is a band called Sfederna, um, who from Sweden, as you might imagine. Uh, and the record is called Herd, or something, which is Hearth. Uh, although you wouldn't really know it from the cover, uh, which is more sort of moon in the woods kind of deal. Yeah, um, it's kind of weird. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's a great cover. And yeah, that's good. They're, uh, what, what is the label for this? The label is Carnal Records, which is very small roster, very Swedish, and really good stuff, honestly. Uh, true, true underground shit. Uh, it's got, uh... I, I was, I just took a quick look at it yesterday. Uh, Domgard's been around for a while, has a lot of integrity. Uh, Graf Wittner, these are both two of the better kind of Swedish anti-cosmic bands. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, some band called Contamino, who are crushing and kind of like Nidden. Um, but, uh, so cool label that I need to check out more. Very Terminus label. But, uh, Sviderna is cool because they seem like they are, seem like mostly only known in Sweden or in Europe. I've never heard of them, and I'm really into shit like this, and this may be the most Swedish black metal band ever. So excited <laughs> to bring you that. All right. Um, well, in that case, uh, let's get started with Macabre Omen's uh, Anamneses. So we've touched on Macabre Omen a couple times on the show um, as sort of a side thing, but... I, I want to make it very clear that both of us wholeheartedly endorse Macabre Omen as one of the best, like, nowadays black metal projects. And, and by there. nowadays, we mean anything since 2000, right? It, Pretty much. Yeah, I mean, technically, Macabre Omen is maybe rooted. Maybe we want to wind that up to 2010, but... Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, Macabre Omen is technically started in 94, but they really only started getting real attention with the release of the first record, uh, the first full length, The Ancient Returns, yeah. in 2005. And uh, I discovered them when I was a teenager, a little bit after The Ancient Ooh. Returns came out, and I was fucking blown away. Which is interesting because it is not my typical style of music at all. Um, how would you describe this? I think there's obvious comparisons to kind of like later Bathory, but deeply Hellenic, mm -hmm. almost like a pure Greek interpretation of like Hammerheart by Bathory. Would that be accurate? Yeah. So I got into him with Gods of War around 20, uh, 2015. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't heard Ancient Returns still. I assume it's amazing, but it's I still haven't gone back to it. 
I love that this guy's a Greek and writes songs about Greek shit, but always poses with a fucking claymore. Yeah. Um, I think he lives I think he lives in the UK on the yeah, cover he, of Gods of War. He's he lives in one handing yeah. a claymore. One handing a claymore. And uh unlike members of certain German bands, <clears throat> Moonblood, uh he actually <laughs> knows how to hold it. Um, but um uh but like <laughs> there's a great photo of the Moonblood guy, the big guy in Moonblood. Uh, just holding a claymore with both hands, which is what you should do, but like near the end of the hill. Yeah, that's so not that's like, not good. <laughs> like, that's, that's gonna fly. Gonna, yeah. That's gonna fly right out of your hands as soon as you strike with it. Yeah, that might hit you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, but um, yeah, it hurt itself in its confusion. <laughs> um, but the uh, but basically, I think Hammerheart Bathory is definitely a good just overall mood. And the scape scope of the compositions, um, mm-hmm. it's obviously rooted in the Hellenic BM tradition, which you can hear clear much more clearly, I'd say, on Amnesis because a lot of it is these tracks that were written in the nineties. Yeah. Um, but I'd also say that there's a depth in the folk influenced riffing. Right? He's got on Gods of War at least. He's got this really sort of fluid kind of droney, folk instrument sounding, clean toned riffing. That's like that sounds... that's like the ancient returns. It's very similar. Okay, word. And so that to me, maybe now you'll have this we we covered it on Terminus Prime. That to me is very following the voice of blood and thousand swords. It's yeah. like and and Graveland is also a band that's often compared to Bathory. Um, yeah. so it's in this B- Bathory Graveland tradition, but the riff a lot of the riffing style is like Coming, I think, from this raw sort of extraordinarily lo-fi midair of Graveland. Um, it, it is, but to, it, but to be clear, Macabre Omen. We, no- we call it a black metal band as a generalization, mm-hmm. but yes, yes. To be more precise, a lot of this, a lot of the melodies on both Anamnesis and on previous records. Mm-hmm. are in some ways sort of a Hellenic reinterpretation of, like, slowed-down NWOBHM melodies. There's a lot of traditional heavy metal, as well as a lot of gestures towards 70s rock, both of which Corthon from Bathory mm-hmm. was a huge fan of. So we're getting a kind of tr- a true gestational idea of Bathory. It's not meaningless cloning. Yes, yes, he listens to the bands that influenced Bathory, and he listens to Graveland in relation to Bathory, and what he takes from Graveland, there's no riff on any of these records where you could be like, that's a Graveland riff. Yeah. They're often, they're not corded the same way. They have more emphasis on leads. He layers them and harmonizes them. And they're often much longer phrases, mm-hmm. right? It's much more like complicated heavy metal riffing. And this is a thing I was thinking about when I was listening to, um, God, one of the many projects of this dude, um, Blackosh from Root. Who's got oh, yeah, this, yeah. this band called Kales that I was mm-hmm. geeking out to you about. And Kales is also, Blackosh is a total bro. He just got drunk one night and started giving away his shit for free on Bandcamp. Um, <laughs> and, uh, we, we chatted a bit and we definitely got to review his new record on Terminus. But, um, he's, uh, he does this Bathorian black rock where you can tell he listens to rock music and like, can play rock music, whereas a lot of people end up in that territory by accident, and it sucks ass. And I think on Anamnesis, you can really hear the rock music in Macabre Oma. Definitely. Does that make sense? No, 100%. And I think that his... his on unders- the older tracks, especially. Yeah. yeah, especially on the older... But but also on Anamnesis. So, for clarification, yeah. uh, this is a... this Anamnesis is one long new track, a 14-minute new track... And a repress of a lot of the old demo and split material that was super hard to get a hold of um, back in the day. But for clarification's sake, um, let us Which, listen to yeah, a little sample. bit of old Macabre Omen. Um, let's listen to just the opening minute or so off the first track of The Ancient Returns, which will kind of give people an idea of where he's coming from. Because obviously, with just one new track, we're kind of going to be talking about the band at large. <laughs>
glad you showed me that. So you got to go back and listen to that record now, obviously. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. So he has this motivic way of writing where all these themes were already there on the ancient returns, too, right? Yeah. It's kind it's kind of like Horn. I was but about to say it is more... like Horn. He's playing with these same ideas of folk melodies forever mm-hmm. and reinterpreting and yeah. rearranging them. Um but it's exquisite. But his, you know? <laughs> I would say his stock is a little bit deeper. And he's less focused on, and he's got these harmonic, these droning harmonic ideas that you don't get in Horn. Horn has gotten to more variety over time. Uh, there are a lot of different ways. But um, the mileage that Macabre Omen can get out of this set of ideas is astonishing. Which is, um, which is really intriguing because... This new track, which we're gonna we're gonna talk about momentarily, is mm-hmm. wow. This is it's incredibly complex. Um, mm-hmm. It's beautifully layered, and uh, it, like I, I I don't even know where to begin. This is one of those contenders for song of the year. Um, it it is possibly like Macabre Omen is a whole album band, but this might be one of the single best songs that Macabre Omen has ever made. Um, you know, it's certainly better than any right, better than uh, any sort of one-off thirteen-minute track has any right to be. You oh know yeah, I mean? it's it's so listenable. And this whole record, <laughs> normally you would criticize a band for doing some release that's like one thirteen-minute new song and a bunch of old demo shit and yeah. putting it out as a full length. But when the band is this good, who gives a shit? And the reality is, the depth of what's going on on this thirteen-minute song is. There's yeah. as many ideas in it as there would be on, like, a 30-minute record by another band. Sure, you know? sure, sure, sure. So, with, with that in mind, let's listen to a sample off. Uh, the the full title uh, of this track is Anamnesis from the Past, parentheses, Sirens Calling. So, uh, obviously, you should listen to this whole thing. It's very difficult to pull samples from this because yeah. it's so nested, the way these shifting textures work, but... Mm-hmm. Um, I, I just kind of pulled a sample of a very cool part that I loved, so let's just give that a try from about the middle of the track. <laughs> It's it is macabre omen, but here's my spicy take. This is this is the best prog song of the year. Hmm. <laughs> I think there's always been an underpinning of kind of seventies prog rock to a lot of macabre omens arrangements, but I think it really flowers here um, in a but beautiful what's way. What's an example of that? Well, when I listen to this, I would say you know there's. I, this is not what people would conventionally call prog rock, but I would suggest that it is. There's like a touch of kind of Steely Dan arrangement in the way the the drums and the guitars intersect. There's a little bit of early yes on this, or even um, uh, even like a little touch of like Jethro Tull with those kind of clean vocal passages. I well, think there's I fucking hate Steely Dan. Um, I Jethro... love Steely Dan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah, yeah, well, you know, whatever. I'm just gonna, like, you know, there are certain things where I'll go down with the ship with, in terms of being a 17-year-old punk, and gotcha. that's one of them. Um, it's, uh, you know, hate Steely Dan, hate Pink Floyd, fuck that shit. Uh, <laughs> um, but, um, but I think I hear you. I, I mean, it's certainly more, I think it, I think it's easier to explain now why... Anamnesis, which is this very new thing, is on a record with all this old shit because Anamnesis is more overtly rocky yeah. than Gods of War and the Ancient Returns. Uh, 
as far as I heard, at least. It's, um, it's, th- yeah, that sort of shift into the more open, rockish chording, um, and I can, I guess I can hear the yes there. I did listen to some yes as a long-haired 14-year-old. <laughs> um, I love yes. And I, I, I actually yeah. love a lot of, uh, classic prog stuff, you know, before... I mean, Roundabouts yeah. is undeniable. Like, yeah. if you like cool riffs, Roundabout has cool riffs on it. It's just, um... Well, as as kind of an aside, as kind of an aside, as kind of an aside, I would also say this is one where I've talked about it a couple times, but uh, Vinter Sorg being a touch point for this sort of thing, a a a project that's basically forgotten at this point and is dismissed at large as just kind of like okay, he's from you know Bork Nagar and Arcturus and stuff, whatever. No, Vinter Sorg solo stuff is very worth listening to. And uh, a, a lot of it's very I comparable. I need to give that another try. A lot of his... Also, mid- J- yeah. J- oh, go ahead. Also, Jethro Tull is basically a metal band in a lot of ways, right? So, oh, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, or yeah. a lot of the not necessarily prog, but kind of adjacent to that scene, like Thin Lizzy and everything is basically... Oh, metal. sure, sure. Yeah. Oh, that's 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 shit that Greek people have to like, right? They've got to like Jethro Tull and Thin Lizzy. No, actually, um, a lot of Greek people do like a lot of that very, like like, enthusiastically guitar-centric 70s rock, mm-hmm. you know? Not the mm-hmm. stuff that was mm-hmm. pop rock, but where the guitar was the clear leading instrument in the way that it would be in a heavy metal band, so. The Greeks are almost as lit as the Finns, I think, as far <laughs> as just being an extremely metal people. Uh, I went to get Heroes once at a place in my town, and the dude working the counter was liter- was from Athens, and he just looked at my shirt, didn't know the band, he's like, you like metal? Oh, good. <laughs> um, and, uh, and he was just like, yeah, man, I fucking, uh, love Greek black metal. And I started naming bands and he was like, oh yeah, listen to all those. Yeah. Hell yeah. Um, <laughs> and it turned out that he liked Greek black metal and like, uh, bunch of hardcore shit. And he liked, um, and he himself played acoustic Greek outlaw ballads. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 the, the Greeks are cool motherfuckers. They've right? got this. This <laughs> they've got this weird. Like, if you listen to some of the Greek folk music, it's like, oh man, there's some weird notes that are weirdly similar to like traditional kind of Western folk music in the U.S. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, but yeah, he liked Macabre Omen. So uh, you know, um, well, it feels like let's... Macabre Omen is now becoming like a bigger touchstone than they were back when we first found them. A lot of people are talking about him now in a way that I think people didn't it's really more consistent and fully developed possibly than any of the other Greek bands. Yeah. That would be I would, my I would agree. It was a it was a slow burn. He's a late bloomer. Um Rotting Christ, you know, really did in many ways if have a really good run, but they seem to have and they had a great revival with Aolo, but they seem to have burned out again. Uh Varathron's obviously Cool. Yeah, I don't mind the new Rotting Christ stuff. It's just they're more of a rock band than a metal band at this point, which is fine. It's still enjoyable music. They're, they're just rehashing stale soundtracky motifs from Ayala, though. They keep reusing it. Yeah, it's, fair uh, they're very good live, though. I'll give them that. Yeah. Ayala was the ultimate soundtrack to the 300. There should be a cut <laughs> of that movie that just has that record. Um, anyway, so I guess we better play another sample. Speaking yeah. of which, comparing it to Greek black metal from the 90s. Um, what was interesting about at least Gods of War is how little it directly sounds like Rotting Christ or Varathron. Yeah. But here on this track and on the older ones, that connection is a little clearer. So this is just later in the track, and I might also see if I can compare this to one of my favorite moments on Gods of War. Throughout Macabre Omen, there are these big open spacious moments, and then these moments where he really digs in. Yeah. In a classic metal way. So here, here we get one of those. Sure. Um,
Yeah, so it's like we we were talking while I was playing. There, there's more kind of thin Lizzieisms in some of those riffs there, which is it, I had never thought of that as a real touchstone for this band, but maybe it is. Thin Lizzie is a kind of yeah, as a type for. I mean, I you clearly need to listen to more Thin Lizzie, but as a type for this, I mean, I was just saying during the break, right? There are a couple, even before you know, more relevant to real black metal than Venom or maybe even early Bathory is shit like um, Hell's Bells by ACDC and yeah. Emerald by Thin Lizzy, right? And those yeah. are both thema- in their writing and the basic riff ideas and the sort of like Dorian pentatonic primordial yeah. reptile brain thing. Those oh, yeah. sound like Graveland before Graveland. Oh, right? no, uh, we should totally yeah. do a, a Terminus Prime episode about <laughs> dark, hard rock songs of the 60s through 80s that were clearly formative, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And it's like, and those stuff are so distant, nobody notices those, because those are outside the proto-punk, proto-metal lineage, yeah. right? Um, uh, but yeah, no, um, those, the, 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 yeah, Thin Lizzy as a perce- as a model for playing these kinds of wailing pentatonic leads that sound European. Especially with those big it's, squalling uh, pinch harmonics and stuff. Oh, God, I love the pitch harmonics. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, the fucking distorted flute that comes in at the end, which yeah. is also, I mean, not natural distortion, right? He's just bending it. Yeah. It's no wonder it takes this guy so long to write these fucking things, right? Oh, this yeah. is the work of years. Well, it's, like, um, well, I mean, I, I, and I'm also not... just for the listeners, the Rotting Christ thing, I assume you all, everyone who's listening to this show knows Rotting Christ, but like, you could hear, right, that Gods of War had melodic motifs and ideas that were like Rotting Christ, but there wasn't this reliance on palm mutes, mm-hmm. but what's really cool on, in, on, uh, on, on, you know, Anamnesis is he just digs in on the fucking, uh, chugs, right? And the I mean, chugs it, and the bends. And, and you probably, get the fast version of it and you get the slow version of it. There's probably an argument to be made that, you know, the defining quality of Hellenic black metal is that it does not, you know, uh, Scandinavian black metal is kind of quick to jettison its rock and mm-hmm. traditional metal heritage. The Hellenic bands that never really did that. Yeah. yeah. They they held on to a lot of kind of those primordial ideas and kept working on them, like folding them over and over like the batter for a cake or something, you know, just and I, I, constantly I would, reworking yeah. them. Yeah. But I would say one thing that sets Macabre Omen apart is that... um. Bands like Rotting Christ or whatever seem to have, you know, they heard and they were in touch with Euronymous and stuff. They heard it and they were like, oh, we could do something like that. But it almost seems like they deliberately, and this is a good strategy, they deliberately avoided listening to it too much, I yeah. think. Whereas um, uh, Macabre Omen, I think, is a, as Greek as those other bands, but has clearly been paying attention to an absorbing shit like Greek stuff, shit like the more florid, folky Scandinavian stuff. All of that is folded into this as yeah. well, I think. Um, oh, it was one the last thing I want to touch on, just for this mm-hmm. track, before we kind of talk about the older stuff. Um, yeah. The drumming on this track is fucking incredible. Like, they Oh, yeah. Especially in the opening three or four minutes, there are these incredibly challenging and yet smooth sort of polyrhythmic ideas and shifting mm-hmm. time signatures, you know, which again is leaning into that kind of proggy heritage, but it never feels, it feels so naturalistic. Like, you know? Well, it's natural. I think this guy really gets, he probably listens to Greek folk music and he certainly gets the metal idea of it. Yeah. And he plays in that way with the, there's a sort of freeness and organic flow to folk music that even in stuff like Graveland, who also sort of gets it and is really the paradigm for getting it in extreme raw yeah. black metal or whatever. He, even in that sort of stuff, it doesn't compare to the fluidity and dynamism of the structures in the yeah. Roman. Well, you know, uh, you know like what? if you heard that shift up to the tribal toms at the yeah. end of that sample with the whooping and shit, it's mm-hmm. like, you know, yeah, Darkin does his best to program drums in interesting ways and stuff, but, like, the when he's programming them now. But, like, this is just... This guy is as much of a drummer as he is a guitarist, right? Yeah, no, there's, there's a distinct quality to the... 
Well, actually, I think he has a drummer now. I think that I think he played drums oh, on the early okay. set, but I believe he has a drummer uh, for this newer that stuff. That would make sense. Let um, me see what Metal Archive says. Not that that's yeah. Oh yeah, reliable, he, but... he started in 2011 because I remember the drums were programmed on uh, the Ancient Returns, I believe, oh, and they were so totally that's fun. what kicks Gods of War into fucking just god level territory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, mm-hmm. so it, this is just. Yeah, so, I mean, for the record, like, I know this has been kind of sprawling, but, you know, especially given the That's, nature of this... sprawling music. <laughs> it is, it's incredibly sprawling music. This It's so intelligent, and this is, you know, you know what this is great for? Show anamneses, if you're some kid listening to this in high school, which, I mean, there's probably a couple... You know that, like, long-haired dude that just says, like, Orion by Metallica is the best thing he's ever heard? And you're trying to, mm. like, you need a guy to start a black metal band with? Show him <laughs> an- show him Anamneses, which, in the best way, has the best parts of Metallica as well as yeah. black metal. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, Dissection has all the uh, superficial Metallicisms, uh, and it makes Dissection less of a black metal band. But, um, yeah. this is... I mean, the Metallica's great weakness is that they think they're artists, right? I yeah. mean, and that they're sort of uh, the sprawling pseudo-medieval shit. And I get how, in some sense, it was influential, but, like, the way that guy does neoclassical guitar or whatever, it's all, oh, it's all hokey. Uh, yeah. um, the thing where you have this really exciting, just retarded lizard brain chug, and then it's like, bling, ding, 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 lyrics about a concept no one cares about. Um... <laughs> And, like, then, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's sprawling. Metallica's sprawling in a bad way. There's way too much fat. And the part of me that's like, you know, no Elvis, no Beatles, no Rolling Stones, fuck Pink Floyd. Here's that and barfs. Like, I didn't like Metallica until I heard, um, you know, the stuff from Kill 'Em All. Yeah. Uh, yeah, But, um, this is the opposite of that in that it's sprawling, but it's all killer. Yeah, I, I, I actually said in the notes, the only tragedy about this 14 minute song is that it's not 20 minutes because it could be. Mm-hmm. And I would be, the 14 minutes went by so fast listening to this song. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, was yeah, like, yeah. wait, it's over already? I need another six movements, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. As I was saying, yeah, as I was saying to you just before the show started, this guy is one of those guitarists, like, like Roman Sanko, where I just like hearing him play. Yeah. He's, this guy could plug in and start improv. You can tell this guy can improvise because it's how some of these melodies come up. Senko is just like, Senko writes like riff, 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 and he just plays in this brilliant way. He just, even at their worst, Druid songs have interesting ideas in them. And this guy, Macabre Omen guy, is a guitarist in the old, yeah, in the 70s tradition. He listens to Jimmy Page. Yeah. He listens to the best parts of Jimmy Page. Yeah. He will, yes, exactly. The best third of Led Zeppelin. Yeah. He'll Jimmy Page you the primordial lizard brain heathen black metal you've always wanted to hear Jimmy Page play. Well, honestly, right? in a it's sense, a... in a sense, this music Also, is... Achilles' last stand is a post-second wave BM song. <laughs> second wave BM. Honestly, I think... I, I, think... I mean, to... To... to use a phrase to use a lot, this is... I think of this as sort of a, a perfect synthesis of probably 50 years of guitar music, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I do, I, 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 I actually, as I've gotten older, I really appreciate these bands that don't draw a super clear distinction between 70s prog and, you know, 80s punk and 90s heavy metal, you know? It's like they see mm-hmm. it as part of a continuum of elaboration on the guitar as an instrument, uh, you know, an experimentation mm-hmm. with opportunities. So, mm-hmm. and I think that's what we're seeing here is it just kind yeah, of, as a, far as, yeah, a 20, this, the, Macabre bowman has been around since 94. It's taken this long to get to this point, you know, because yeah, of the, there are the, very, ugh, the sheer number of ideas is incredible. Yeah, within any genre, there are a few things that jump out as part of the history of guitar music arguably yeah, arguably nothing in hardcore although i'd say discharge is a good candidate um uh because just of the sheer innovation um yeah. but like uh you know like 
I mean, in Black Metal, the classic examples of it would probably be the really classic example is just De Mysterious, yeah. right? Which isn't my isn't even my favorite of the second wave stuff. And I'd say Infernus is my favorite riff writer, and so pure riff writer in some sense. But Infernus mm-hmm. is deliberately siloed into second wave black metal. Yeah. He sort of codifies the style. In you know, just Euronymous is a brilliant guitarist, right? Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, we talked about Amoebix is a good example of this. Amoebix is this band that's just like formative extreme music, but also overtly tapped into 70s rock. And yeah. Like, and punk and post punk and all that shit. Right? Yeah. Mm. So, so oh. as we can touch on the other stuff, um, obviously this is basically just a, a piece about Macabre Omen, but let's talk a little bit about the older stuff. Uh, on this, mm-hmm. which, you know, makes up the bulk of the running time of this record. I had never heard this material before. I've just heard it's the facts. fascinating. And what's fascinating is how even the earliest tracks, I really like how they're arranged in chronological order. Um, after Are the new okay, song. Cool. Yeah, from, uh, you know, because it starts, uh, with, uh, uh, shit, let me look it up. So it starts Oh, in, I see it. Yeah. Yeah, it starts in 96 with the Olympus demo and it ends mm-hmm. around, uh, 2000. Can- can we play it just a minute from Olympus? Because this is so different from everything. It's consistent with everything we yeah. just played, but it's so different, and it's so different from other Greek BM. And it seems really like it was a thing that was before its time. And oh, now, definitely. given how given how recklessly florid and melodic black metal is, or that you've got kind of very profound rockish music coming from bands like Flusterars, mm-hmm. the t- Time for this has come back, I'd say. Yeah, so Play okay. Let's office. listen to uh, the first minute mm-hmm. off Olympus. It's a rock song. It's a rock song, but I would say more importantly, it's a Burzum song. It's uh, mm-hmm. that that is closer to what's actually happening on Philosophem, I think, mm-hmm. than most of the imitators of that record. You're saying the flute at the end? Uh, well, not necessarily the flute, but clearly because we were talking like especially some of those drum beats, there are more like electronic or sort of like trip hop beats than they are conventional Mm -hmm. rock beats in a way Uh, which you know i mean burzum uh varg was constantly listening to uh kind of kraut rock and early electronic music and stuff and i think a lot of that is in here and and my spicy take is that although i think i actually stole this from someone again someone who wrote a really good blog back in the day that i sort of knew who uh Taught me a lot. I learned a lot from this guy about how to think about music, but, um, even as many of his opinions as I hated. Uh, <laughs> but, um, the, uh, Bur- Burzum really, Varg hears his own music and always heard it, at least after a certain point, as this kind of floor, this sort of, uh, fertile, melodic, lush stuff, right? And, uh, and Bellus is really actually the fulfillment of the Burzum aesthetic. Uh, and, and, and that's my spicy take. And this sounds <laughs> like the Burzum of the Burzum from Philosophum that sort of blossoms on Bellus, I'd say. Um, yeah, I can get that. But but it really reminds me of s- staying within metal territory. It the only analog I can think of this in terms of mood. This is like a pastoral mood, right? Yeah, this it's is sort of chill. sensual. It's like it's sexual. It's kind of natural. It's yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a touch of almost sort of gothy ideas on oh, it like no, well the thing yeah so i yeah you can go a few places it's like goth via shoegaze 
And yeah. so the band, yeah. like, Slow Dive would be the best band where there's a direct continuity to goth, but Slow Dive, this really could be a Slow Dive song which, off of, which like, Morning Rise or something. S- spicy Take, uh, the ultimate shoegaze album is Suvlaki, It's Not My Bloody yes. Valentine's album. Oh, it's not for Loveless. sure. No, we yeah. completely agree on that. And by this Oh, I didn't point, know. Yeah, we've never talked knows. about that. <laughs> oh, no, no. No, completely agree. And by this point, everyone, real shoegaze is not about guitar pedal effects. It's about chording and melodic ideas. And uh, all the... Um, there's a whole rant about this, but Slow Dive got fucked by the UK press, and I think at this point, everyone who really knows, knows, even like the hip, the, yeah, yeah. Rock, the indie rock guys. Um, but yeah, no, Slow Dive for sure could be doing just exactly this, or like on Pygmalion, they had the kind of electronic beats, but also within metal, the kind of guys who were listening to Slow Dive and Goth, um, would have been Tiamat on Wild Honey. Oh, yeah, definitely. Which is a very... I, I don't know that that album's executed perfectly, but it's a that's good album. a... It's a very good album. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, um, and then I guess my my sample off this, just... Uh, there's a lot of seeds planted throughout these demos and splits, and mm-hmm. not, yes. not all of them would end up being what Macabo it became. But I found... But it could end up being what your band becomes. Yeah. So here's an example of just something so bizarre, completely different from everything (laughs) Macabre Omen did. Let's listen to the first bit off The Past is the Future of the Present. And this was just a a track off a random... Great title. Yeah, it's a track off a random 7-inch he did. So let's just listen to the first bit of that. And this is... Mm -hmm. Holy shit. (laughs) Okay. Fucking schizophrenic is that for Macabre Omen. You'll never hear that sound again from them. It was just a, a singular idea that he decided to run with, and it's fucking sick. <laughs> and it's an example of, like, that's an example of him, even at the earliest days, trying to figure out what are the Scandinavians doing and how can I put my own take on it. Because this is his big, super epic take on, like, this is how he hears Emperor. Yeah. It's like... Or it's, uh, I mean, it's also taking a little bit from, like, really early Nocturnal Mortem, where they were just crazy mm-hmm. with the sort of programmed synths. Um, mm-hmm. So, but I guess, I mean, the real reason I picked this is because I, I've wanted to just play a sample of this band <laughs> on on the show for a while. These are, this is a guy who I just, I've fallen in love with recently called Grolfried, who... <laughs> Who is the, yeah, yeah, you remember when Girl I showed Fried this. is a quest giving character. Oh, Girlfried is absolutely, oh yeah, he's giving you a, a really weird side quest. So, I just want to yeah. listen to the first minute of a track he did called Nox auf Friedhof Neue Welt, uh, which translates roughly to like, the, 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 the new night of the graveyard world or something akin to that. Sounds again, sick title. Um, but let's check out the first minute of this and see, Holy shit, look at how ahead of its time, because remember that Macabre Omen track is 1999, so let's listen to this now. Mm
you showed me that. Oh, maybe you showed me the Witchmoan Girl for its split. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I showed you a different it. one. Yeah, yeah. That I was, really like this. Dude, it's it's so... It, I mean, it's just... It's the perfect ultimate synthesis of Dungeon he, Synth and Black Metal, you know? <laughs> yeah, Dungeon Synth obviously does not have the legs to exist as a self-standing genre, and most of those bands should be euthanized. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is... Uh, um, th- but some of them are interesting, and it's clearly you can't deny it as a thing that has happened, right? Yeah. And they've been developing this very specific palette that wasn't really NBM. So trying to say, how can I incorporate that? How can I make it satisfied in the way BM is and more like cool black metal songs uh, yeah. is a good idea. And, and apparently and the answer like, is just put a blast I, beat under it. You know? Yeah, yeah. Put some blasts on that bitch. You know, <laughs> throw some. Oh, sorry. Throw some. Be- throw some bees on that bitch. Um, and uh, and scream. And uh, you don't need to be good at. Sc- and also just distort the shit out of the keys so that it does the work of the guitar. I like that he hasn't added a token guitar line under it. No, that's the thing. Because well, it would have been shitty line in shit. Well, he's inspired um, by this, like, insane guy from Germany who's done a bunch of projects. Oh, is this dogs barking, man? <laughs> uh, I don't... I was thinking, this reminded me, there's a legendary... On uh, Metal Archives, is it somewhere? And the picture of him on the front is a dude in a fucking witch hat, just alone in his It's Corneus. Hat. You're and, right. It's Corneus. Yes! yes. He has it's recorded that, one album and credited it to his dog on the vocals. Yes, that that is him. That is who Grolfried is inspired by because he heard... Corneas doing, <laughs> he heard Corneas basically doing black metal with no guitar because this kid in Grolfri yeah. couldn't play guitar. So he was like, I'm just going to make black metal, but entirely programmed with synths and, and drums and I'll yell into a but mic sometimes. This is m- more satisfying. You know, I mean, Corneas is mostly a curiosity, whereas. Oh, this yeah, is no, this is like, better than Corneas. This is satisfying I, I, musically. It's I like, have if you a, like raw black metal, you can listen to this. I do have a special place in my heart for awful but awesome bands that have done a thousand demos and you've got 30 projects and that's i mean i i love those guys <laughs> you know yes, just because but you, you you are a musical pervert um, yeah, yeah that is so. true so, so i guess <laughs> i i mean that's I mean, we've probably said enough so obviously macabre omen i it's like need and division 187 they are a canonical band for this podcast who you need to listen to would you say that's and accurate? Hopefully yeah. you already do. Yes. Hopefully you already do. You know, um, if you're a death metal guy, you should still listen to this just because of how outstanding it is from a black oh, yeah. metal things. If you're one of those super raw lo-fi black metal guys, um, you should sorry, listen to this it. is relevant. This is extremely relevant to your interests anyway, and it might help you broaden your palate and sort of uh, um, get over the kind of... Um, mannered production we were and playing limited deliberately limited playing that we were talking about on the other show with the uh uh when we we're talking about the sort of the limitations of that lots of great riffs but sort of limitations of the board is rope um, yeah, yeah um which by the way i had a really good conversation on instagram with this guy bull god whose channel we support about it uh and yeah you know we had an interesting exchange about that yeah uh, so uh all right. Well, um, let's take a let's take a quick break and uh, jump back in with, as always, a little bit of brutal death. <laughs> How's it going, Connor here from Oncology, and you're listening to Terminus. All right, we are back, and uh, we've got Niall Obstat with Antimatter, um, which I guess is part of the uh, the. The, the series of me showing you brutal death records. And uh, I think you were saying you actually like this one? Yeah. Um, I would say that to me, so going into my newfound, uh, limited but wide-ranged quiver of mecha death metal, which yeah. is everything from my term I've used to, because I'm so far into this, it's like a term I want to use to encapsulate everything from brutal death to tech death to slam to... um. Uh, to slamming death metal, which I guess is a different thing. Uh, whatever. But, um, uh, this kind of deliberately inorganic, um, maximalist modern death metal. Yeah. Uh, to me, this has, there, we did that, um, oncology, right, with Connor, yeah. who you did that first interview with. Um, yeah. that I thought was a really exciting, good record with cool, kind of slayery riffs in it, but I haven't gone back and listened to it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I have, in fact, I was going to tell you, I have gone back and listened to Induced. I listened to that album twice through the other night. Induced is um, sick. <laughs> Yeah, Induced is super brutal death metal that's basically sort of war metal. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, we, we did a fun episode on that a few back. But um, Nile Obstat to me has the kind of the appeal of both, with also with this melodicism that was uh, in the Greek band, uh, something uh, sickening horror. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember... Remember how with, so this is a link back and links it to Macabre Omen. Remember with Sickening Horror, how they said, how, uh, I said, these parts sound a lot like Rotting Christ. And you were like, oh, that's just Greeks. They don't like their classic heavy metal. Yeah. Well, okay, that, that may be so. And we've just heard that in Macabre Omen. But, um, these guys are not Greeks. They're from Colombia, right? Yeah. Uh, but there are these ideas that kind of connect to that that I haven't heard elsewhere that I hear here. In some of these tracks that I want to get into later. But I thought this one is, as far as I've, you know, I did, I was short on time for the episode today. And so my listing was cursory to a lot of these things, which I don't like. But uh, as far as I've heard, I like this one a lot. It's some of the better stuff I've heard in this thing. Oh, hey, that's so, good. So uh, yeah. so I guess this is your kind of first approach at Colombian Brutal Death, which really yes. is a distinct style of its own. It's a distinct regional style. And uh, kind of the godfather of the scene was a band called Purulent uh, that released a couple records back in, I believe, the late 90s. And then it expanded into this whole series of sort of incestuously connected brutal death and slam bands that all kind of trade members here and there. Um, mm -hmm. But the big defining qualities are that Colombian brutal death is really fucking technical like almost like uh -huh. spazzy and math core to a degree, which is not quite on this record, but on some yeah. of the, some of Niall Obsat's older stuff, it's like you could confuse some of it for math core, but also weirdly sloppy. It has an almost grind core feel of like these guys are all great at their instruments, but they only had like a few practices together and then they had to record the album, you know? So it gives That's, it. I mean, like, I can respect that being cool. Oh, it's very cool. And as a result... That's kind of like Kagumalo tech. Yeah, it's... Yeah, it definitely is. There's... So there's this quality to it where it's... It's almost more extreme than most kind of mm -hmm. techie brutal death stuff just because it's like, this is a band that's barely hanging together. It's... They're just trying to get to the <laughs> end of the song more or less at the same pace. You know what I mean? So, um, so older Niall Obstad, uh was definitely like that. This one, uh, this is 10 years past their last record, I believe. Let me, let me double check that. Yeah. So their last record was in 2010. This one's in 2020. Just because a lot of these guys, I think, are, I mean, they're all just, you know, working day jobs. And it's like, yeah, I think we have a tendency to think when there's a huge gap, it's like, oh, did something happen? It was like, no, they just didn't feel like it. They just didn't have ideas to do a new record or something. So they get around to it. They do a new album. Um, this is definitely a, a, much more matured kind of take on their sound. Um, mm -hmm. uh, oh, I, I forgot. Alongside Purulent, there's a very important Colombian uh, tech brutal death band called Internal Suffering, who are kind of the more refined side of the style. Um, and there's a lot of that mm -hmm. in this record. But what I found really interesting is these guys are also reaching back into kind of deep cut NYDM for a lot of these kind of groovy parts. Interesting. There's like, not a, what do you mean, like suffocation? Yeah, there's suffocation. Or the kind of stuff we talked about on the last episode that was more relevant for, um... What, what was our death metal last episode? It was... Oh, uh, uh, Encoffinized. For Encoffinized, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, they were more in the Baphomet vein. This has... Mm -hmm. And then they kind of join in, like, internal bleeding, like the early internal bleeding stuff. But a big touchstone here... Uh, would be dehumanized, who are a very important kind of almost cult New York death metal bands. You know, they break up, they get back together, they break up, they get back together, and they're always amazing. I saw them live one time. It's one of the best shows I've ever seen. Um, but to give people an idea of what this sounds like, uh, I, I've, I've chosen kind of like groovy parts for the most part for my samples. Um, but this is this is an album with a lot of variation. So let's just listen to the back part of... Teratomachy. Ter Teratot? 
Which would translate to something like rule by monsters, I think. That's sick. Um, <laughs> rule by monstrosities, yeah. So let's give that a try. you chose the part that starts with a slam <laughs> I, to be fair there's very few like true slams like that on this record um yeah. i would not call this a slam death record by any stretch no i was kind of mad on that slam in particular maybe if i'd heard what led up to it better or could you know that would be yeah i'm i'm more i'm more i'm more interested in the stuff that happens after it uh like me that, too yes i thought it developed really cool into the thing after it yeah. One thing that I want to specifically point out is on that, like, slowed down blast beat chug riff. Do you notice mm -hmm. how the, the drums and the guitars are kind of, like, sliding on and off each other in terms of time? I think I hear what you mean. I, I just, I like the interaction between the chug and the half blast in. Um, do you mean that there's some, like, intentionally out of sync thing going on? There's this... Something that Niall Obstat does, and they used to do this on their old stuff, and it's still here, is they've got this very slippery sense of timing. Like, if you listen very closely to that, and obviously a lot of this comes from just listening to this kind of, like, very kind of techy music a lot, like I have, you'll notice yeah. that the guitars and the drums are kind of falling in and out of sync with each other, and they're, they're almost breathing, kind of contorting back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, and this is something. Which oh, so is happening at a scale I probably can't really recognize. Yeah, it's, it's very but They're subtle. doing the same yeah. kind of thing that good raw, good war metal, early Diocletian, or like a sloppy raw black metal. Exactly. Band, there's, do, there's this right? like yeah. internal, like between. Or even pulse. in Live in Leipzig or something. Yeah, yeah. So it, but it's so yeah. slow. You can tell it's being mm -hmm. done deliberately here because they're able to do much faster, more technical stuff perfectly. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it sounds in time to me, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. I... No, so there's, but this is something they keep doing is they've got this, uh, like, sort of free flowing sense of time, but they always snap together on the one of the next riff. So you can tell that it's not an accident. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. doing something deliberately. Um, which is an idea that I find fascinating and has really only been practiced deliberately by some of the weirdest of like the ultra brutal death crowd. And they're kind of brutal. Well, would it be yeah. on, would oh, it ahead. be on the, um, fucking the, God, again, I'm, I'm slow on band names today. The fucking awesome German band, uh, the, uh, Forgotten um, that spell? we reviewed and we love. Oh, oh. No, 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 no. The one with the black, the, 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 the brutal death band. Fucking, um. From Germany? God. Yeah, you know, the best brutal death metal band ever. That's technical. And that's, um, that released the, uh, oh, Sanity. Defeated Sanity. Oh, Defeated. Oh, go. okay. <laughs> Defeated Sanity is, um, obviously I was thinking way, way more deeper. Jazz yeah. <laughs> is, yeah, Defeated Sanity is way jazzier than this, but it's, um, there, uh, no, I understand. Like, There's a similar idea of, like, it's, we're kind of, like, free-forming within the measure. We're going to snap together at the end of the measure, but we can we can kind of, like, wander in and out of each other's rhythmic space uh, within yeah, these measures. Yeah. Which is a very jazzy thing to do. And actually, I've got a later sample that I get into the kind of, like, subtle jazzy quality of this music a little bit more. But uh, let's go with something you cool. picked. Cool. Let's... Let's go to my theory, which is just what goes together well, uh, 
Greek black metal and brutal death metal. Okay. Uh, you've heard this. What's, you know, brutal death metal? A thing that chugs a lot. Um, a thing that could maybe use a somewhat more developed sense of melody, a more conventional sense, uh, at, at least to my ears, sometimes more of a, uh, or at least that's a thing that adds to it. It's always a distinctive quality when you hear it. Um, a band like Psychroptic, we've talked about a fair amount, yeah. right? Which has a lot of chugging and a lot of these kinds of strange melodies that aren't really like mellow death melodies. Yeah. Well, one way to, one way to bring that out would be, I don't know, like in, uh, and they're more of a tech death band, I know, but here you get this thing that's just, this is very, although there's a lot of subtlety going on, this is very direct, blasty riffing with kinds of melodic ideas that are not at all mellow death, but are very uh, gut-satisfying big melodies over these blasts and slowdowns. So this is from the beginning of The King of Plagues. All right, let's try that. Yeah. That riff at the end. Oh, and also, it was funny, just listen to it at the very end, there's a little bit of that sliding happening in the interaction between, like, that that tom beat and the riff. It's, mm -hmm. I really like Dude, the way that, these guys play together, you know? That chest thumping tom thing, right? This is, these are ideas that he was, at the beginning, I feel like I'm mentioning them all the time today because they're just one of my major reference points for a certain kind of stuff, but the drums were doing the tech death version of Grave Landing at the beginning. Doc, yeah. doc, 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 doc. And the macabre omen would do that too, right? Mm -hmm. Or the, the big sort of Tom moment. And just, you get what I mean about the melodies, right? These are kind of Dorian riffs, but they're not sort of sugary. Um, no, yeah, definitely. And, and yeah. I think a lot they're of this... In the way that Rotting Christ is extremely melodic, but doesn't sound like Melodeth, right? Yeah, well, and I think this is a band in particular, unusual for the scene, which still has a lot of respect for traditional heavy metal and thrash, which you will get uh, yes. at, the, at the very end yes. of the record. They do a cover of a band called Angel Negro, um, who I assume mm -hmm. are just kind of an underground South American band. I'm not familiar with them. Mm -hmm. And that is a straight kind of old school thrash song that they've pumped up cool. and turned into a brutal death song. Um, but yeah, and it's like, I, I also like a, a, a thing they do a lot on this record, which we're going to see more on my next sample is, uh, they're kind of building these riffs out of simple phrases. A lot of these are kind of cut time riffs that they're arranging and rearranging on the fly. You know what I mean? Yeah. Dude, I just noticed something random, and I've got to say, there's on Bandcamp, you can buy the discography, but it's not the discography of the band, it's on the label. Yeah. There's an <laughs> album by Waste of Humanity called, it's literally called Push the Week Around. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty sick. <laughs> We we play bully metal. Um, no, I was, uh, I was actually brutal bully metal. <laughs> I was looking through their, uh, you know, before we got started, I was looking through the discography on this label, and I was like, oh, man, there's actually more stuff I remember. There's a lot of re-releases of kind of classic Colombian death metal albums that uh, really deserved more attention. So props to them for, you know, kind of working it out and trying to expose this stuff a little further. Um, so real quick, let's get to my next sample. Um where I want to expand on both the idea of this sort of phrase-based riffing, as well as mm -hmm. the kind of jazzy or like almost free jazz quality to a lot of this stuff. And this is off Quantum Reactor. So let's try that out.
That was that was like an anti mosh call at the end. Oh yeah, yeah. I, they do a lot of like kind of play in with your it's expectations. Like, motherfuckers, get ready to technical blast. Yeah, um, I love that. There's a real playful quality to this music that I enjoy a lot. Yeah, I could hear the free jazzy thing. I don't think that's too much of a reach. It's uh, you yeah. Know, well, it's, it's not. It's not as like ostentatious but i've noticed on a lot of free jazz stuff and honestly i really love free jazz like uh peter brotsman's machine gun is probably like i you know top 30 albums for me or something um like of music period um but i love the idea that it's like okay so let's build a song out of these short little phrases they built a song out of like halves of riffs but let's just play around with how they interconnect and uh, how many times we repeat them to create this sort of maze-like structure within the music. Um, because it's like, there's no variations on any of those riffs. It's just, it's very binary. We've got a set of like three or four ideas and let's just keep changing the way they intersect, which is a really interesting idea for this style of music. It's very mechanistic, but it's very kind of exciting, sort of in an old suffocation yeah. way, I think. Well, this is another one of those bands like Defeated Sanity, where you get the feeling of kind of um, uh, either inorganic things moving like living things or dead things moving like Like you were saying with Induced, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's got this, um, you know, I think the other reason I keep connecting it to black metal is similar to that. It's like, although this band is black, one thing black metal does well that we'll touch on with the spit era now probably is at least in the classic second wave tradition, it sort of refuses binaries yeah, or refuses sort of refuses to accept what you see as two things that don't go together. So mm-hmm. the way that, you know, uh, Classic Emperor is both ba- both a punk band and this epic Nordic symphonic band. Yeah. Uh, or, um, you know, that's the greatest example, I think. Um, like, well, yes, it's all, we'll it's all about the study things. of contrast, you know? Yes, yeah, yeah. And the point that these two things do go together, right? Um, and with anti Anti-Mitre, there's a similarly this highbrow emphasis on rhythm and technique, right? Mm-hmm. But it's all the technicality is in the rhythms and the structures and a lot of these riffs are sort of sort of like simple viscerally satisfying three or five note riffs yeah uh, it's, like um, the, the technicality there's no, there's no like let me show you how many notes i can play which t- is i'm thankful for yeah no the technicality yeah. of this really comes from a sort of top down idea of structure where the the yes. song structures are very convoluted even though individual passages i mean i could probably play on guitar most of the riffs on sure. this record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I could I, not even, arrange even them. Even I might be able to. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, I couldn't arrange them the way they do, which is a very interesting idea for how to make technical music. You know? Although, I don't know, trimming single strings is hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> you got a busted so, arm still, you're fine. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, All right, so what's your last sample? Oh, by the way, both of the, both of the tracks you chose to sample are both tracks I thought about sampling. Ah, I see. I'm glad we covered it all then. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is a cool record, and I think it's another good um, answer to those people who think that death metal today, the avant-garde of death metal, is not in this conspicuously arty bullshit that comes out with the fancy cover arts and gets reviewed by, you know, the websites. Yeah. It's, um, it's in It's in stuff like this, and this is way more... I'll take this as far as sci-fi stuff that is musically sophisticated, melodic, and viscerally bludgeoning. Yeah. This over Blood Incantation. Any fucking Oh, well, you know, I, I gotta say, that. you know... It's, Love ripping on that band. It's I gotta a, say, you know, as a guy that's listened to Brutal Death basically my whole metal life, it's very important that you say that. That there is real artistic import to stuff like this and not just stuff with geometric shapes on the album covers that sound like ulcerate you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, the, I, these guys literally can't afford a cover art that looks like that and they also don't care about whoever's idea of good taste and it's also right? s- kind like, of sick give me some of that <laughs> sci-fi yeah no it's it's like it's the sci-fi version of the sort of like low bro- it's the sci-fi ver- equivalent of low-budget Frank Frazetta art for black or heavy metal right yeah it's it's it, um, it's, it's sci-fi love it's just like, you know Give me, 
Yo, give me one of them CGI orbs. <laughs> give me a CGI orb with some tentacles and some tiny people approaching it. Some lightning. The lightning's pretty cool. Yeah, it's yeah, fucking yeah. Sick. You're approaching Which, the orb. By the way, that's what every internal suffering Dude, we've got to learn like. how to harvest. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Oh, yeah. We got to learn how to harvest the energy from this orb. But will it destroy us in the process? So, uh, Speaking um, of which, just so let's before, go to my last one, which is well, again, real just, quick before we get um, to your last to sample. His highbrow free. Oh, mm. uh, we we had a, a break there. Uh, real quick before we uh, get to that, you got to listen to Internal okay. Suffering because their primary themes are Lovecraft and Warhammer Forty Thousand. So, oh, okay. Well, I will. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, anyway, your last sample. Uh, 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 yeah, that's uh, that's I'm. I'm running for president in 2020 on a platform of two things. Love that and Warhammer 40,000. So, make 40k real again. Yes. Um, it's, uh, the, uh, okay, the fifth war, um, this is just some viscerally satisfying good death metal that, again, sounds like the way you thought death metal sounded before yeah. somebody played you OSDM. Right? I gotcha. Um, Let's try it out. Yeah. that mosh part oh yeah well it's it's dude that's I did, a straight that that could have been off satisfaction as the death of desire no i was gonna right? say well it's funny because i didn't like that when i first heard it but now that you're playing it again it's like okay that's pretty sick yeah i was gonna yeah, say why even, didn't you like that <laughs> well even beyond satisfaction i would say that's almost like a mad ball riff or something you know yeah, or as we, I think we've started to realize might be the source for all these metallic hardcore ideas and explain why metalheads hated it so much. <laughs> Pantera, right? Yeah. Did, that... did, 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 I mean, dude, you hear that riff and like specifically the kind of mosh for that riff is the thing where it's like you're driving a really big car with your arm <laughs> fully extended and the wheel is over the size of your body. But it's definitely a one hand windmill kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Judge junk. Jajun, judge John, swing it back and forth. Uh, camo shorts. Um, <laughs> it's totally and, jumped uh, the fuck up in the best way. Yeah, but the beginning of that, you know, had me, as soon as I said just good, satisfying death metal, it had me eating my words. Because the beginning of that, that wasn't so much free jazz as, like, classical. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This really, I mean, again, in this kind of melodic, but not Dorian scale, not sort of neatly nice sounding, highly melodic, strange tremline that you get a little piece of, and then they stretch it out more elaborately once or twice, and it has this sort of um, beautiful arcing quality to it that is like romantic classical music or like um, late 19th century classical music, right? It's uh, yeah. There's an organic quality to it there that's an organic inorganicity there that's really cool. Um yeah, uh, I think... Uh, this band fucking kills, honestly. <laughs> you know, it's like when I first started this, you know, I had some reservations just because, like, 
Uh, I've got a soft spot for, like, their first record, um, Mm -hmm. which was a lot more chaotic than this, but... The more unhinged quality. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Which which I always love, but listening to this again, just listening to the samples, it's like, no, this is a really good album. And, you know, I'm I'm glad that... Because Colombian Brutal Death was a bigger thing back, like, around 2010. um, And it's been kind of Mm -hmm. forgotten now, and I'm glad there's still guys doing it, kind of bringing it back and... You know, I'm glad there's a label like Rotten Cemetery trying to bring it to the forefront again. And, you know, that's good. You know, I like this Columbia in general. I think, like, um, you know, if you're in the black metal scene, everyone always talks about Cogamello in Brazil. But, I mean, the rest of the rest of Latin America really is uh, just extremely strong for, you know, South. I mean, even even leaving out the Mexican black metal stuff, which is good or like the chasm or whatever in Mexico, even just strictly South American stuff. You know, there's tons of good shit down there. And again, as far as countries, there's a bunch of outstanding stuff from like Argentina and Chile, you know. Yeah, as as far as countries keeping it real in the way that the Finns and the Greeks do, right? Uh, or maybe the Poles would be one of the only other places you could think of. Places yeah. that are just, like, <laughs> where it's like everyone, you know, yeah, you have this vision of going someplace in South America and you just walk down the street in a, in a metal shirt and everyone's like, I fucking love that band. Oh, yeah, <laughs> like, yes. some of the best shows yeah. I've ever played with uh, various brutal death bands I've been in. Uh, have been, uh, you know, mostly, you know, mostly, yeah. most of our audience was South American guys, and uh, those are some of the best yeah. shows I've ever played. You know, they have it, a real It's passion. important to remember that, uh, it's important to remember that uh, Columbia, I mean, this probably gets said all the, the, the this band are probably going to roll their eyes at this point um, when they hear this, but it's like, <laughs> you know, Columbia really was, and to some degree still kind of is, I think, I, I'm not sure, but was one of the most war-torn places on Earth for a long, long time. Oh, yeah. Right? So, the people playing brutal music in places like this have a first-hand experience of it that people in Western Europe or the U.S., unless you're, like, in the army, you have yeah, no idea. Yeah. It's, right? a, it's real. Um, you know, unless you're, in the, yeah. uh, unless you're in the army or actively engaged in rioting and street fighting, right? You just <laughs> yeah. don't know. Yeah. Um, All right, so, Antimatter, good album. Let's take a quick break, and uh, we'll get on to your side of the episode. Hey everybody, we're back, and uh, if you've been listening this long, you probably know that you're listening to Terminus, the finest extreme metal podcast that's ever existed, and you're probably thinking to yourself, hey, what's a good way to give my hard-earned money to these people so I can listen to more metal autism? Well, fortunately, we've got a way for you to do that. The easiest way to support us is through Patreon or Subscribestar, depending on just how much of a weirdo you are, where we have various tiers available for you to uh, donate your money to us and gain access to our bonus content, our uh, private Discord server, and even some more extensive options for you truly insane people. So, if you enjoy what you're hearing and you want to hear more of it, check us out on Patreon or Subscribestar and considering... Consider throwing a few bucks our way because, like I said up in front, uh, we are basically doing this as a full-time job alongside our full-time jobs. <laughs> yes, and a uh, the lowest tier starts at a mere $3. So $3, for, you know, and you gain access to all these hours of content? Amazing. <laughs> yeah, for what one... One pint of beer cost in a bar 15 years ago. You can listen to, ter- you know, a I was, month. I was about to say, probably more than fucking 15 years ago. Probably like 30 years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, there were a few. There were a few. But uh, yeah, it's... um. There's still like a anyway. couple... There's still a couple places around here you can get it that cheap, but you gotta go way yeah. the fuck out in the boonies for it. Mm-hmm. All right, okay, so... Okay, so we're back uh, with... Ikotka. Zagavor. Um, out on Sound Age production on CD, but it's basically independently released on Bandcamp, and I think they've got themselves up on Spotify, too, so they've sort of taken this release pretty seriously. Um, so there's some backstory and lore for this release, it appears. I, I love a black um, metal band with lore, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it appears unlike, uh, as opposed to fictional lore, it appears to be semi-real lore, right? So, um, the first thing you gotta know is that Ikotka, what they're named, is a demon from the north of Russia who lives in men for years. I don't know what that means, but I'm intrigued. <laughs> and as you found out, what else does it mean? It also means hiccups. 
uh, apparently. Uh, it's the word for hiccups in Russian, which is and so curious. At the root of these, what has to be going on here is that they used to be the same thing. Probably. I'm yeah. guessing that in a shamanic culture, right, uh, in a shamanic culture that believes in sort of spirit, uh, where you believe in, like, spirits and everything and in spirit possession, right, like any sort of Siberian shamanic stuff, uh, although all pagan paganism has re- aspects of that in one way or another, but in, especially in something like Siberian shamanism, right, you know, spirits everywhere, spirits that can enter the body, spirits that take different forms. Well, what is the hiccup? Oops, you just swallowed an evil spirit. Well, it, um, it happens sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, although, you know, maybe not, maybe it doesn't destroy its host. So maybe it's just a demon of some kind. It's just uh, sort of like, like an imp would be in sort of Western it's mythology. Probably it's probably one like, of those. It's a minor spirit, you know. It's one of those things that probably becomes a demon once after the nominal conversion, right? Yeah, in Christianity. Yeah. But uh, that would be all my my hypothesis. But um, would be interested to hear what the band thinks of that. But um, they also have their lore story, which is it actually says legend. <laughs> one night a few years ago, three men obsessed with a kotka held a jam session in an abandoned temple in the Urals. They performed ancient traditional Russian charms and spells with the accompaniment of raw and atmospheric black metal. Some fragments from these sessions were recorded on tape and saved. These records formed the basis of the album Zagavor that was not published previously. So this is kind of older material. I really Zagavor, hope this band... Re- Z- Zagavor means charm. A- a not, not as in charisma, cool. but as in like a, mm-hmm. a charm of protection or something. Yeah, so there's, unlike many of the people pretending to be like, oh, you know, welcome, come, yeah, Watain, live ritual, right? <laughs> this is music that you, as you'll be able to hear, is actually recorded definitely live in an abandoned building, possibly semi outdoors, right? Something with yeah. ruined roof or something. Uh, and, um, and there is a performative quality to it. That is, the words they're speaking are supposed to be charms that do things. Yeah. Um, We've got a, uh, a charm against snakes, a charm against longing, which is very interesting, and a charm against the dead. So I kind of like the uh, I like the convergence of, like, sort of Slavic mythology and sort of, like, upper Slavic, uh, like, mystic animism. It's kind of interesting. I like this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Reminds me a little bit of something like a dead reptile shrine or something. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. Um, or maybe the kind of thing, the tyrannic thing we got with the sort of intersection of European and Turkic stuff in, um, what's it called? That one you showed me a while ago, Marble Bog, that was really good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or in the third of Darkest or songs that are really good. Um, yeah, so, man, when when Dark Astra are good, they're really good, and when they're bad, they're, they're really incredible. Bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think it depends highly. the The main guy's the the drummer, so I think it's highly dependent on who's playing guitar. Yeah, um, yeah. and how far they dip into kind of schmaltzy drug territory. Yeah. So, um, in, in terms of this record, uh, I've got a. I, I don't know. Is this a spicy take? But I would describe this very intentionally as a post Blazeberth Hall record. You know what I mean? I think those are yeah, I think Blazeberth Hall I think again, I my one of my pet things is that I think you overstate how central BBH is for Slavic black metal. But um I don't I don't know if I do. I think I would actually we could have yeah. an argument about that. I think because I would I would right. actually kind of organize modern black metal into a set of like um like U.S., Scandinavian, Greater Eastern European, a lot of which owes to Blazeberth Hall and Western European. You know, it's reductive. I hear BBH but is kind idea. of marginal in the way that B- Japanese noise core is marginal. It's marginal, ergo extremely popular with certain people. But are you going to um, deny the BBH on this record, though? <laughs> no, no, not at all. I think, interestingly to me, the BBH comes in. In the way, it's definitely, yeah, post BB, it's definitely, well, highly original. The BBH to me comes in, I think, in the most interesting way it could, which is in the way they do things rather than the melodic yes, sensibility. Yes, I, I would Does argue that. Does that make that, sense? No, I would, I would agree. I think that there is a lot of BBH technique on this, but the result is not 
what we would consider Blazeberth Hall black metal. And I think that that's how I try to use the term post. You know, we're, we're taking I get what the you technique mean. Okay. and using it for something else. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. No, in that case, I completely agree with you. And then if that's the underlying form, then a lot of the content, as far as the riffing style, again, would be a lot of the riffing style you get from the more muscular riffing and something like Hate Forest. Maybe a little Graveland. I didn't hear that here, but you you put that down. Um, a touch of it. Not, uh, not hugely, yeah. but a touch of it here and there. Yeah, it, but it's really hard to pin down where exactly the melodic sensibility is coming from. And in general, I think we both agree this is very original. I um, agree, yeah. There's something very interesting got going a, on, you know, which is which I've is got intriguing. A couple, oh, yeah. it's it's intriguing how original it is, although it's extremely minimal music, which is very difficult to do, you know. Extreme, yeah, absolutely. In some sense, that's my favorite thing: is original, minimal music that's rooted in a tradition, but sounds nothing like the other stuff. I've got a couple guesses on more immediate influences for this, which I'll get to in a sec. But why don't we lead with my sample, uh, sure. my first sample, which is just, and for all the samples I've got here, you could basically write. You'll get into this when you talk about the structure. You could basically write uh, <laughs> something till wherever. Yeah, <laughs> but in no, this case, we're gonna start on. Start on 0.00 and go till whenever. Here's Charm Against Snakes. Um, Let's try that out. So that is a beautiful riff, right? Yeah, and it's it's pulling from a lot of different places. Um, I mean, there is there is a quality to this record, which is obviously I always use BBH as a touchstone, just because I think they have been unfairly forgotten by the mass metal scene. But oh, that's why I get annoyed by it because in the raw black metal scene. It's like all black metal is BBH at this point, right? Yeah, yeah. So for me, they've not been forgotten, and I, if anything, I'm trying to push back on their influence. I, you see, like, I'm trying to look at kind of the overall metal scene, the over, or yeah. even just the overall mm-hmm. black metal scene, which has basically forgotten that they are instrumental to defining modern styles of Eastern European yes. and U.S. black metal. Yes, because we talked about that. You, well, you've pointed that out for like Wolves in the Throne Room and for Winter Filleth or whatever, right? It's just formative. And these and, are big bands. And right? Weakling who led to Wolves in the mm-hmm. Throne Room. That's all just mm-hmm. like corrupted forest stuff for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> Word. Uh, corrupted Forest, I'm sure, is a band. but That um, would be sick. Which, That's um, a sick name. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, which, so which BBH would you say this resembles most? That kind of riff. Branicult. 100%. Um, well, the first, mm-hmm. the opening riff is Brianna called. The second one, I think, is more Hate Forest. Did they even oh, change riffs at all? I barely heard it. No, they, they uh, did. Uh, halfway through, they changed it to a second riff, although that's part of the quality of this record is this very, like, I I have a whole argument about should, do we even read this as black metal, really, but we'll get into that later. Well, it's, um, I would, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, It's, um, the begin. I, I think, yeah, so, it, it has this really interesting tonality, which 
spans what we would conventionally think of as major or minor kind of feelings. Yeah. That kind of crossing a major and minor tonality in a weird hypnotic way. Definitely Branicald, I can hear that. Oh, definitely a very Slavic thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, any that kind of sophisticated sense of harmony, even if the riffing is simple, is important to black metal in general, I think. Uh, and, and especially important to, like, this Ukrainian and Russo style yeah. black metal. So let me think of some, some... I think the place where this is also... To me, the thing that originally hit was Astrophase, when I heard Which that. Which is a, a great band who more people should listen to. Astrophase is excellent. Wonderful band. So for those not listening, Astrophase was sort of contemporaneous with Hate Forest, very early um, Ukrainian scene BM, uh, and that was Thurios' main baby in the way that Hate Forest was Sanko's baby, and then they really combined forces in Druidk. But if you want to hear the root of some of the more sort of, uh, especially long before Sorrows, the root of some of the more major key kind of um, very folky, uh, more sort of exuberant folky riffing that you get in Druidk, it's an astrophase, actually. Yeah. Uh, but in a much more kind of like Graveland, but also kind of like Treldom and just any Scandinavian band, right? Mm-hmm. There's there's this raw, blasty, kind of deliberately stupid quality to a lot of the more aggressive riffing. And then there are just these big kind of sunny, droning Slavic riffs that well, are just a- beautiful. Astrophase mm. is kind of stupid smart in a lot of ways. because Exactly, have, yeah. Because a lot of Astrophase is based off the contrast of these very, like, dumb, straightforward riffs with these almost progressive touches in the more expansive sections. And, and it's yeah. almost all done with power chords. <laughs> Yeah, like it's very it's, and very simple modifications of them. It's using yeah. a very primitive sort of black metal guitar style to create stuff that's very outsized from that, which is what makes it mm-hmm. so interesting. Yeah, and so so that was really cool and really hypnotic. And another reference point for a sensibility like that, which honestly, there's a little bit of a synchronicity thing going on here. Someone on one of our um, discords uh, posted Old Wayne's yesterday, which is a band. I know that I like, but I've never listened to a full album by, and I always keep being like, dude, you need to go back and like just really yeah, dig through the old Same, lines. I have never actually listened to um, the lines. So, like Astrophase there, and like Ludomissile, who you mentioned during the break, although yeah. Ludomissile is way more technical. Yeah, Ludomissile um, does not sound like this. Ludomissile is great, but... They are those... Yeah. They are... They're sort of, quote, marginal Slavic bands in that they sound more like Scandinavian stuff. Um, yeah. But Old Wayne's is... I don't know, the thing he played was fucking sick, and it had this, again, just sort of uh, extremely minimal, epic melody. You can hear how it relates to Immortal, but you can also hear it relates to Graveland, and uh, very, and and all the usual Slavic suspects, but it's just sort of um, very sprawling, um, Siberian tundra kind of BM. Yeah. Uh, and, and somebody pointed that out. I'm indebted to the... Uh, Maybe we can get to this now. Um, so the band camp comments <laughs> on this are kind of interesting. I'm indebted to Ein Harriar, who has a pretty good point about this. Their sound makes me think of their fellow countrymen, Old Wayne's, if they had decided to go occult and open a door to another evil dimension. But there's that evil word. Did you hear any evil in that riff? No, and this is something we talked about before we started the episode, which mm-hmm. is some of these band camp comments are bizarre. I mean, I'm sure they're all good hearted, but this mm-hmm. is. This doesn't strike me as evil at all. There's nothing sinister. There's nothing attacking me. I guess it's it's sort of like when we were talking about Reverorum Ibn Malak, people describing mm-hmm. that as evil. It's like, no, it's not mm-hmm. evil. It might be chaotic or distressing. <laughs> Reverorum Malak is literally attacking you, but it's not evil. <laughs> yeah, but it's, uh, but yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. No, yeah. this is, I mean, I, I feel like this is not, I always associate evil with something that is really, like, inflicting itself on you. This is music that lays back and chills out, you know? How can that be it's evil? It's very <laughs> distant. I mean, it is distant from the sort of sugary, pseudo-BBH stuff that's come out in its wake. It's very distant from something like Valknut, or any of those bands that think they sound like Forest but sound like Valknut. Yeah. Um, uh, not that Valknut... Valknut's a great band, but yeah. it just is what it is. Uh, this is very distant from the more melodic evenly consonant influence of Blazeberth Hall and it's a, or the sort of fruity pseudo druid stuff and it's also very different distant from uh the more 
yeah, I don't know, the more sort of malevolent North second wave sound, whether it's evil or not, right? This is, um, that riff was powerful, but not evil. And so, yeah, we get a lot of these comments, right? This guy says, uh, morbid entities must have been involved in the writing. Well, depending on how you interpret that, maybe. <laughs> uh, um, the demon thrives. Uh, let's see. Okay, well, that guy just, okay, he just likes the record. Um, all the songs have malevolent and engaging sound. I mean, uh, it's not malevolent music. Vibe. It's 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 chill. It's animistic. Yeah, I think it's, if, it's it's summoning, uh, and it's not summoning anything if, evil. You know, with summoning, I think the things that summoning are destructive oh, no, no. powers, but they'll help yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, they're like, they're they'll destroy the snakes. Yeah. They'll help you. <laughs> you <good>. know, <laughs> they'll help you overcome the longing gnawing at their heart. They'll defend you from the undead. Right. This is like calling. When a shaman is engaged in magic, they do things like uh, you call your spirits, and your spirits yeah. are your aids yeah. um, that I mean, uh, do certain tasks for you. I mean, I'm the Catholic. I'm supposed to find this evil, and this is, like, very chilled out, really. <laughs> yeah, to me, I immediately identify with this music. I'm just like, this puts me in a good fucking mood, you know? Yeah, no, this is, it's, like, um, relaxing to it, me. It's dark and violent enough that it's not sort of... um serene blissed out music but it's certainly not um yeah it's not atmo it's not even you know? no and it's not even battle music whatever battling here is is spiritual battling yeah, i um, think there's some like sort and, of preparatory battle quality especially yeah, preparatory about, for preparation for spiritual battle like you're you're saying your chance before you go onto the field of battle you know it's like oh yeah or that or that exactly for preparing for real yeah. battle yes you're summoning your charm against the dead okay. um so let's uh let's get into my first sample because this is where i would say this is probably my favorite track on the record uh charm against longing and this is one which is I mean, we're talking about an album with three, like, full tracks and three sort of Russian folk things with improvisation alongside it. Structured weirdly mm -hmm. like uh, uh, Battlefields by uh, Hate Forest. Um, hmm. But this is sort of the most sentimental track on the record. So, of course, I'm picking it. So let's listen to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's listen to this clip of, from uh, Charm Against Longing. I mean, yeah. and by the way, the uh, the the title great for that idea. Really like that. Mm -hmm. anyway, let's go ahead. that out to me because that wasn't the part of that song that left leapt out at me when i heard it before but that's gorgeous i'm very intrigued by that because i i like how and this is where i get into the sort of post bbh idea that could be a a riff from forest at the end of the song but here it's towards the front mm. of the track mm -hmm. so there's sort of a more dynamic idea of structuring at work here and honestly i would argue Although I, I will fully admit my, my understanding is limited. I can feel the brush of Graveland or of Hate Forest there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I'm glad to hear that, bro. That's nice. Yeah, guys, I've been I've been pushing those bands on you hard oh, lately. Uh, oh God, you say that in such a condescending way. I want to come up there and kick you. No, no, I didn't. I didn't mean that. No, I, I didn't mean that in a condescending way at all. I well, is, that is it, it, would it be kind of accurate? Way. You know, like yeah, no, I think that is it. No, I, I'm not saying that's why you think it because I've been pushing it on you, and I'm not saying. I needed to push it on you because you were <laughs> ignorant. You know the BBH way better than I do. Uh, um, to a degree, you uh, know. Uh, anyway. Yeah, I mean, I've, no, I mean, to be honest, it's just, you know, I prefer always, it's, you know, BBH is for my personal preference to a lot of it is, I can listen to some of it on loop, but it's, a lot of it's too weird for me. Nah, man, um, Forrest is the a, best band ever. <laughs> like, <laughs> Oh yeah, no, Forrest. Well, some of it's, yeah, no, I mean, I really like that one, um, uh, God, some of the Forest song titles you can't even fucking say on air, um, but, <laughs> you know, it's like, Jesus, um, but, uh, but like the second yeah, Forest know. record from 97, um, which is some yeah, shit in Cyrillic, um, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, the oh. one that, the one that has Wotan on it, or Odin on it at the end, that's a great track. Um, well, yeah, my favorite, apparently, just looking up on Metal Archives, it's called Like a Blaze Above the Ashes. It's the second record mm. from 97, that's my favorite Forest. Um, da, 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 da. I can't what, remember it exactly. I was about right to say now, that's but. that's too many notes for a forest riff. So. No, no, it has all those riffs. I I think I like the riffier Blazeworth stuff, is what I mean. But um, oh, uh, well, anyway, one thing, well, so one thing I that does to... sound like Blazeworth, but it does also sound like Graveland and uh, Gra- Graveland and, and Hayforest, especially if they're more sort of tonally strange, right? Yeah, and I think that one thing I wanted to say about this record is this is in contrast because I, I think people are going to like fail to make this distinction. So blaze birth is aggressive and driving, but hypnotic. Mm-hmm. This is yeah. meditative. Same with hate forest, right? Yeah. yeah. This is meditative music. This is mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. designed to get you in action. Like I can thrash around my living room to forest. You can't do that to Itoka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, so it's really it's black metal that functions as ambient music. I would say in a sense that almost calling it ambient music, I mean dark ambient is such a loaded term, but in a sense ambient music is almost more accurate than black metal because obviously the whole all the rhythmic ideas are really receded into the background of this record, which is fine. I'm I'm cool with that. Um so this is like it's taking this blaze birth idea of riffcraft and it's extending it into almost non-metal territory if that makes sense i think i follow you i think well here's the thing it's um you could make a record that was based on bbh riffing that was very ambient that would either literally be ambient music like a whole album made out of like the ends of BBH songs without drums, right? Yeah. Some of which are very beautiful. Yeah. Um, uh, but it could also be noodly wank, right? It could also be the most pretentious record on earth. Yeah. Um, this is very unpretentious. Thing, I'll give them that. Yeah, yeah. One thing that prevents it from being that is that it has, if it was produced or arranged somewhat differently, this could be an aggressive driving black metal album. Yeah, no, the um, production think, it, the production is an important quality to this record. Like the uh the which very Which isn't production. I think they just put a tape recorder in the room. Oh, you know? I, I I I think that's what we would like to imagine, but honestly, just from experience, it's very hard to get this sort of like blown out reverb drenched production without a lot of careful work to it. I I think there is well, serious sure thought about I think there's serious work done on the production side of this record. About about how they mic to the space or something? Yeah, because um, you were talking about an open roof. What I think is we're talking about a, a room they're playing at adjoining a long hall, and they probably mm-hmm. placed like some of the mics at, like, at the, uh, the front of the hall, like the mouth of it. And some at the end. And some at the end, So because this, this is a record that feels like there were like 20 guitars. You know, track together. Mm-hmm. Uh, 20 guitars, but very distant, right? He, and you could yeah. produce it in a very upfront way, and it sound very different. Yeah, but I, I like that quality because it, it removes the sort of, like, black metal aggression from it and turns it into something different. 
Yeah, so I'd say this is black metal, but it's the black the side of black metal that has nothing to do, wants nothing to do with heavy metal, right? Yeah, it's which, um, which in one way or another is true in all those Slavic bands, but a lot of them have this more go for the throat quality. The thing that makes this thing like like spiritual, maybe you know, talking to summoning sort of powerful spirits or aggression on a spiritual plane or preparation for a battle is that these riffs all have they're often very melodic very beautiful riffs like that but they all have the kinds of things that i'm a real stickler about more melodic riffing which those these kinds of aggressive shapes to them right yeah or tension built in the cording sort of propulsion in the riff itself so that even if it's just this smooth flowing double bass roll under it yeah you can't exactly headbang to it, but it, there's like the spiritual shadow of things like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I get you. You're, you're, you're talking about the idea of creating a sort of inversion of this thrashy energy of traditional black metal. And the negative space of it is sort of shaping a different idea, more in the ambient vein. Yeah, it's like if you were, yeah, if you recorded a lot of these things differently, it would sound like Astrophys and Hate Forest. And yeah. it'd be a very, uh, and there'd still be a different mood because of the chord choices, but it's, uh, you know, it's, and so that's the thing I like, is that you could easily record this very ecstatic, melodic, ambient black metal and have it be pretentious and bland yeah and instead it's the complete opposite of that in part because it takes the black metal parts seriously even as it transposes them into this different context yeah does that make sense no yeah, yeah. no okay, i definitely cool. get it yeah, yeah yeah all right so let's go to your um i think we both agree about what the center of this record is well yeah i mean the center is obviously the 13 minute epic charm against the dead With which isn't always true, right? Sometimes a 13-minute epic is the one you're like, yeah, this is interesting, but I'd like to skip it, right? Yeah, um, no, this is this is clearly, like, the heart of the record. Um, I think mm-hmm. that Charm Against Longing is the best track, but obviously, mm-hmm. in, in terms of the structure of the album, this is the one. So, we've both got samples off this one, because obviously there's... I will say, unlike Battlefields... I really enjoy the like kind of Russian folk stuff between these songs. Um, mm-hmm. It actually adds a lot, despite how sort of trivial that sort of thing can seem in modern black metal. I, I think they really work here, but obviously we're going to be talking about the yeah. full-fledged black well, metal songs. And it has more to do with the fact that these they're brief and the black metal songs themselves have this kind of ambient folk equality whereas if you're going for just crushing a black metal that can feel like filler yeah right. so let's listen to uh, my section from charm against the dead There was so much that happened there. Yeah, which is unusual for this record, which is very restrained and repetitive for the most part. Not it's unusual for that. Slavic black metal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> so, well, what I what I think is interesting, one, I really love uh, early on in that sample, that little nested arpeggio passage, because that's mm-hmm. like the sort of thing you would hear on like Remains of a Ruined Dead Curse Soul by Mutilation. Um, mm-hmm. And, which is like the only gesture towards French stuff, but I always appreciate it. Um, the, the first sample that you did it could be like one of these newer French bands. Not, it couldn't exactly be it, but it reminds me a little bit of uh, 
some of the more spacey kind of reverie mood of some of the newer yeah, French bands. But I, I, I hear what I you get mean. that. Um, yeah. But also, we were talking during the sample, and it's like, oh, that's a hate for us riff at the end. It is, but it's also, weirdly enough, like a modern mayhem riff. Um, the da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah. That that very kind of huh. dramatic, kind of theatrical one. That could be off one. Because, I mean, not to get off topic, but for you, Mayhem is basically Day Mysteries and Live in Leipzig. Yes, I'm ignorant about Cra- I'm ignorant about Mayhem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. And we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna solve that in our bonus episode this week, but <laughs> to, which we record tomorrow. Yeah. Which we record tomorrow, yeah. Um but uh yeah, so that could definitely be something off of like it could kind of be off Ordo Ad Keo, although Ordo Ad Keo, like, gestures a little bit more towards orthodox black metal, but it could definitely be off of Esoteric Warfare back from 2014. Um, hmm. Because, I mean, Mayhem, you know, we've got this idea of them as, oh, you know, second wave progenitors. They've been completely different from album to album. The, you know, they're more like a rock band, kind of finding a new idea on every record. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of that in here. They're kind of musicians, musician types, right? At this Definitely, point, Mayhem yeah. has Mayhem hasn't had spirit for decades, but they, they're just good at what they do. Is that a fair thing to say? Oh, well, saying they don't have spirit is you so You really negative. like Attila. Yeah, yeah, well, also, you know, yeah, to be fair, like... Well, they don't have a, they're not an ideological band anymore, I guess is what yeah, I mean. No, but they're, they're, they're so focused on the music that maybe just the spirit is manifest in the music itself. Oh, I yeah. Mean, I, that's their I band. would argue that yeah. basically every Mayhem album is great. But, uh, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, it, that, that's also like, it's a weird thing where, you know, I almost feel like, you know, a poptimist type saying that but it's like no all these mayhem albums that you don't actually listen to you go to the shows to hear day mystery stuff those are all great albums and you need to actually listen to them you know what i mean fair enough i, I told you i have listened to chimera and i did like it a lot chimera um, fucking rules man <laughs> kind, of, kind of a death metal record but very cool Ki- kind yeah. of a death metal record and kind of a hardcore record in a sense There's i was gonna just, say no it really sounds like napalm death after barney Oh yeah, yeah. There, there's just some like brutal like body mosh music parts that intersect mm-hmm. well with the like traditional black metal. But we're we're getting off topic anyway. So Ikotka. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um. Uh. Yeah. So wh- why don't we play anything more about that, or you want to play rem- play mine? Well, let's just get to your sample. We can kind of go into overall ideas. Oh, I should describe the middle of the song real quick. It's okay. like. One thing they have that's really good in this track is um, skillful use of slow parts, um, which are often risky for black metal bands, I think. Um, but the middle of this track is just big block chords that are shaped like Kate Forest riffs, but are played, instead of this being a sort of token gesture or a we run out of ideas thing, Right? When you introduce a new thing, you want it to be, you always want to be speaking every style you're using as a native language. That's the Mm -hmm. optimum, right? Yeah. When they do this, they rock them out like a a sludge band. They, they play with the tone. They, um, play with the rhythms. They use feedback a lot, which I love. I love the more noise driven and feedback quality in this. There needs to be more of that in BM. And so there's this kind of open idea of, like, why not just do this big, sludgy, slow part? And it really works. And I'm you're going to hear just the trail end of that, and then you're going to hear that same riff idea lock in. Okay? All right, let's, um, let's, uh, let's try that one out.
Yeah, so that's that's both hate forest and kind of Swedish in a way. Well, and I think, yeah, no, I hear that, and we're going to Sweden in a minute. But also, I think, as you said, it's mayhemy. There's these, he takes time with these arpeggiated ideas that are in hate for us, but there's this kind of graceful lingering over them that's very yeah. much like the feeling that Euronymous feels like he's got all the time in the world. Yeah, you know? like when you're listening to Freezing Moon or something. Yeah, he's just, even when he's blasting, he's got all the time in the world. Um, and... You know, like, that's another good thing about this. So, yeah, that was obviously the most hate for us part on this record. That, um, yeah, yeah. Pick slide, the pick slide at the beginning was mm-hmm. so sick, right? <laughs> Get the feedback and Jenna just is shrieking. That's the loudest pick slide I've ever heard. Um, and if, if there's any moment on this record that maybe feels like, okay, the preparations for battle are at an end, it's, yeah. it's about to pop off, it's this. However, you also get these these samples that are like birds, and it's not like eagles screaming, right? There's this great Spike Extreme Wing track where they just have a synth eagle, and he's just like, ear, 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 over and over again. It's not like that, right? These are real, this sounds like field samples of bird song. And they're like sparrows. Um, they're not like a cool bird. Yeah. They're just singing, They're like songbirds, out. yeah. They're, they're what my girlfriend would call the ordinary birds, right? Which, uh... <laughs> You know, she taught me to appreciate, but, um, it's, uh, they're, yeah, they're just birds and, and they, they might be the sound of bird spirits and things like that, right? It's like, maybe you're calling a flock of spiritual songbirds to scare off the dead. Which would I make think it kind of sense, right? I, th- I think this, like, the defining character of this record is like, it's got moments that you could read as aggressive, but this is a very, like, relaxed record. In a lot of ways. Yeah. Is, yes, it is. It's yeah, chilled it's out. Relax. It's power. It's shamanistic, but it's like that slow down. The shaman's going to do shit on his own time. All right. You don't yeah. get to rush him. You're not at the fucking DMV. You chill out. And it's, you know, <laughs> power and structures, right? It's not in any, they're not playing. Yeah, there's this feeling of effortlessness to almost all of the riffing, except maybe those big block chords. They're not punching anything. It's, yeah. um, and it's the power emerges in the rhythms and the repetitions and the patterns over time, not in any individual moment, yeah. um, which is very shame on E. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's really cool. Uh, just the mayhem thing, um, which I hadn't thought about at all in connection to this record. And I hadn't thought about mayhem in connection to hate forest. Uh, yeah. And thinking about that, it's like, a really good band does two things. Um, it makes you hear its influences in a new way. So there you go. Mm-hmm. And it also, and this is the thing I might harp on a bit later, right? One of the weaknesses of this thing that I like to criticize in the raw black metal scene, this tendency to silo off into making these sorts of, you take Blaze Birth, which is already a sort of eccentric strain, already this very focused distillation of certain things about black metal, yeah. And then you make that the entire basis for your sound, right? Yeah. Well, one of the problems with that is that you lose connection with the origin, which are all these bands that sound completely different, but that the Blaze Birth guys were listening to, right? Yeah. This, even though all the reference points we keep coming back to, for the most part, are Slavic, here are these parts that persistently sound like second wave Scandinavian stuff, specifically the most big, obvious, glaring, uncool reference ever, right? Yeah. Which, well, I mean, which it, people don't reference enough is mayhem. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, like at, at this point, you know, people don't, people don't even think mayhem has become so big. They're not influential in a way, you know, it's like, yes, yes, yes. And I, I'm going to have a whole conversation about that when we do our bonus episode where we talk about Grand Declaration of War about how, oh. you know, the, the, the altering of mayhem in the public eye over the course of the past 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, I get what you're saying. It's like, there's these influences that we've just basically taken for granted as so intrinsic. But when you hear guys who are seriously listening to those major bands and picking apart their methodology, you get something yeah. very different. Ab- absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, um, 
What more can we say? I think I think I I thought this was like a cool, really good, cool record before we talked about it. After talking to it and you drawing attention to these different parts and us listening to it again, I just think this is fantastic. You know, I really hope record. they release another one. Oh yeah. yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And uh for you guys, I know you can follow them and probably get a free download, but it's two euros. Give them a little bit of money. Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, just <laughs> let's support these yeah, guys. Throw them who, a bone if you can. Let's um, let's support these guys who are doing shit that is within the tradition, but also expanding upon it. And I'm not gonna say too much, but I uh I talked to a guy with a label and suggested that he get uh connect with these dudes and uh <coughs> cough cough i hope he does because um, <laughs> if he's listening to this because this is these guys need um another label with reach outside russia and they need a, uh, a label that does cool trendy things like tapes which yeah. this would be well suited they say they recorded it on tape okay this is very this is tape music oh right? definitely you know yeah so very good record and uh we will take a break and get to our last record of the night Hi, this is Taylor from Crushing the Scepter, and you're listening to Terminus Podcast. All right, so our last record of the night, uh, Svederna is hard. And uh, this is a band that you were excited to cover, so I think you, you've you known their older stuff. Not really. They're a fairly recent discovery. I found them when I, on Bandcamp when I heard this new one was coming out. So it's interesting about Svederna is uh, well a few things it's um i had never heard of them before and i mean i'm not i'm not like mr i know every band right but like yeah. this is i pay a lot of attention to black metal and especially sort of pagany and scandinavian stuff and you figure and this band's been around for a while and they put out a number of full lengths um and it seems like they're big and or at least two full lengths uh and it seems like they're big in Sweden. So they, I would have expected I've at least heard the name somewhere. You know what I yeah. mean? Not it's at like, all. How, how did this get away from me kind of thing? And so, yeah. And what's interesting about it, I think this is some of the, le- we still, thankfully, the internet hasn't destroyed the idea of regional scenes, right? Yeah. There's still a very strong new Dutch sound. I think an American sound is finally coalescing around this kind of, uh, you know, mixing strains of esoteric blogspot black metal with a basis from hardcore, you know, yeah. this noisy, the raw black metal scene in the U.S. Um, you know, uh, the Finns still just sound Finnish and nobody can stop them. Yeah. Um, they'll never stop. They have no shame. Um, uh, um, things like that. It hasn't destroyed that. It's networked them more. But this is like a band that I think is just really big in Sweden. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think they play. My the impression I get is that they play big live shows in Scandinavia, um, <laughs> the Swedish equivalent to Olduvai Gash, who will undoubtedly become the biggest USBM band. <laughs> one would one would hope. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, Bulgar was saying he liked them a lot too. Uh, apparently, they played a show a while ago with Bonal. Oh, like, I, I had no idea he even played live. Yeah. yeah, he's got a full lineup live. I saw a uh, a live clip on YouTube, and I was like, "Oh, this is this is weird to think that somebody's yeah. doing this well, live." So, in the same way that Oldowan Gash is the po- possibly the most American sounding black yeah. metal band, up there with Finn and Mortem, right? Yeah. The most sort of uh, Western or Americana sounding DM band. Um, Svederna is the most Swedish band ever. <laughs> um, and there are a few characteristic things about that. They seem, uh, one thing that set, so the Swedes, uh, you know, you know me, right? Swedish 90s black metal is a sort of pet thing of mine. Yeah, and, and, and it's worthy of note, I'll fully admit, I feel like a lot of this record is channeling a blind spot of mine. In, especially because you're a lot of the stuff you're talking about is like late 90s stuff sort of like the dark yeah ages. mid to late yeah yeah the sort of dark ages of second wave black metal but you're much more acquainted with that than me exactly during the dark ages the swedes were doing it right but nobody remembers because sweden also produced 
Shite Malodath. And they also produced, as far as the Swedish melodic Black Death scene, right? Yeah. The big one is Dissection, which is... The real is, one is Sacramentum. <laughs> the real version of that, yeah, the sort of the real version of Dissection is Sacramentum. Sacramentum has received a revival in popularity because of their people lift the most poppy Sacramentum riffs to make music like Uwada, which yeah. sucks ass. Um, and I mean, obviously Miglo was influenced by them and yeah. Miglo's great. Right. Uh, um, and there are a number of other bands that channel these bigger Swedish melodic black death bands. So we talked about, um, name dropped Sinira a few episodes ago. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a good band from Chicago with Promise that has the more aggressive, necrophobic side called Ocelegium, mm-hmm. uh, Legium maybe. And there's a band that we reviewed a while ago called Well of Night. Yeah. That takes it to a much more sort of deep cuts territory with this. And this so, is way more yeah. deep, way more deep cuts Swedish 90s black metal, uh, which we could just say it now, right? I think you were about to say it, right? It's a... Uh, Oh, no, I was just going to describe. Gonna oh, no, I was just going to say, oh, so uh, Well of Night, or uh, is that the correct name? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I yeah. think so. Well of Night is sort of like Dawn plus French chivalric stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, Well of Night sounds very like Dawn. So the thing about the Swedish 90s thing, one reason it's been hard not imitated much is it's very difficult to imitate because the Swedes were all incredible musicians. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they develop the Norse stuff by taking it in this very maximalist direction. Yeah. Uh, and Dawn is just for a variety of reasons. The depth of the, the depth of the writing, the depth of the musicianship, very hard to imitate. Well of Night does it pretty well. Another thing about it is that the Swedes wrote full band music. Yeah. Most of these, you need a full band to play. You can't be a one man project and you need two guitars. Um, yeah. so Sverna is a band. So like the early Swedes, Severna are, are really good musicians, but they're willing to slum it. And there's probably yeah. more open space and intermusician-y play in this than any of the Swedish bands from the late 90s. So in some sense, they've, if that was the Achilles heel of the Swedes, that there was just no breathing space in the music, mm-hmm. this is, I think, really nicely addresses that. And, yeah, so it's full band, musicians, musicians slumming it. That's all very Swedish. And where they're really drawing from, from the deep cuts, is a band that's one of my top five or ten. And, like, the first band I really felt like I discovered, which is yeah. Soren. Yeah. Um, which was released on Noevdia, uh, probably reissued in 2009 or 10. Yeah. Um, Amazing, very unique band, very difficult to imitate because extremely unique, knife said sense of harmony. Uh, hasn't been popular because it's just difficult music. Yeah. Um, can't listen to it in every mood. So why don't we play some? I think the first thing I'd like to lead with, and so for me, the only other band I've heard that really channels um, Soren is a band that I found pretty recent, recent find. They're on Nukta called uh, the Greek label, NYKTA, yeah. uh, called Hate Spirit who are Finnish, but sound like a just the manic, rabid, impaled Nazarene, I'm on speed version of a band like Soren. <laughs> um, so Soren has something very punky going on, and they really bring that out. Svederen is punky in a different way. Uh, let's lead with some samples of Svederen stuff that sounds really Soren. And I, I don't know that I have a... Or let's lead with... You know what? Let's just lead with the best fucking Soren riffs ever uh, that there's no perfect analog to on this record. <laughs> but I just want to play it for people because uh, it's fucking sick. And that'll give you a starting type. OK, so this is from just the title track of their first full length. You get glimmer on the Mukritz dupe, which means something like. In the glimmering shadows. Uh, or no, no, sorry. uh the glimmering, I think maybe just like die in the glimmering fog or some shit. I can't remember. It's, it's a cool title. Um, so let's just begin with, uh, the beginning of that and we'll roll it till the second riff comes in. Yeah. 
yeah, it's um obviously well one it's very punky. It's it's more yeah. obviously punky than a lot of its contemporaries. And and, and and anything else from this is 97 and then from anything else from Sweden for sure <laughs> at the time. Yeah, and yeah. I I I'm definitely not I've never listened to Sorhan before, but it was mm-hmm. It's definitely, it's got this weird edge to it. And I can see how it compares to the Svederna here. Um, this this strange punk energy, but it's like, we don't know what to do with it, so let's burst it into these surprisingly technical kind of riffs, you know? It's like, I like yeah. that. I, I appreciate that. And it's also got a thing that'll come up later for you, I think, which is it's crypto thrash. We've yeah. talked about... We've talked about it has the thrashing quality of punk, and it's uh, one of the things that it's driven by those one-two beats. And not there's a lot of blasting on the Soren record, but there's also a lot of those one-two beats and sort of um, and on that second riff, which is just one of my all-time favorite riffs, right? There's this you know rolling downbeat, dug 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 dug. Yeah. Um, it has this very propulsive thrashing quality to it, and I think that we've talked on the show about like. Where did thrash go? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what sort of legitimate extreme music genres has it survived as? Uh, and you had some good answers to that. I can't... Oh, we talked about how in, like, brutal death metal, maybe. Uh, or, parts of uh, it, yeah. Parts of tech death, yeah. And I think certain parts of, like, war metal. And then, like, shit like this in the late 90s. The Swedes always didn't stop liking thrash. One of the first bands Euronymous signed was a Swedish death thrash band called uh, Merciless. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so you, you get the general picture there. This has this glistening guitar tone and it, uh, sort of difficult guitar tone, right? It's, yeah. uh, abrasively cold. Um, and it, uh, has these strange disharmonies that roll throughout the entire riff, right? Yeah. Even though it's very melodic, they have these huge flowing melodies. And it sounds again like, you know, kind of like Ikotka, sort of ancient primordial step music or something. Right? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So, um, let's just roll through some Spaderna samples that sound kind of like this, rapid fire, so that we don't tire them out. Um, okay. Uh, it's, a. Uh, so the first one is just the beginning of the record, uh, Den Archaisk, uh, Den Archaiska Roten, which I assume is the archaic root. All right. Um, You know, without, so, I'm so focused on the first riff there, which hey, you could hear there that sort of, like, the jagged sort of blast beats, but with yeah. this sort of thrashy shape and the weird disharmonic chording, you heard the Soren thing there, right? Yeah, um, I heard that, and then I heard the Slavic riff after it, which is yeah, an I, interesting thing that occurs across this record. Yeah, no, and that's that's a thing that couldn't have happened in Swedish black metal back in the day. Swedish black metal also had, you know, on the poppier side, the Sacramentums or the Nagelfars. There yeah. was some stuff that was a little like that, but you're right, that really is a forest riff. Um, oh, I wouldn't even it's, say, it's not even as reductive as forest. It's it's more contemporary than that. Honestly, it's like almost yeah. adjacent. It, it's the early 2000s version of what would be a Magla riff now. Yeah, yeah. It's there's a big payoff there. Basically, it's like you get your extremely difficult. You get your sort of like otherworldly sort of nightside pagan riff, and then you get your just sort of big ass payoff medieval warrior riff, right? Yeah, it's just, yeah, yeah. you know, and that's almost sentimental, but in a really cool way. Um, 
And this record is called Heart or something, or I have no idea how to pronounce it, but Hearth, right? So it's something yeah. about home. Um, so let's let's roll to another one. Uh, do, 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 um, this is a Fortigan. This is off Fortigan, yeah. Um, one twenty three, just a little bit of blast, sword in style blast in for you, and I'll right. spare you the side by side comparisons, but with more time, I could. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So uh, that first blasting riff sounded a lot like a couple other Swedish bands we like, right? Yeah. Well, you're gonna. I know what you're gonna compare it to, and I'm gonna. And I know what you're gonna say too. Oh, oh, okay. What are you gonna say? No, no. uh, Well, why don't we each try to do the other ones? What are you gonna? What am I gonna say? You wrote it in your notes. You're gonna compare it to Mark. Oh, (laughs) Oh, well, of course you know. What am I gonna? And I think you were gonna say Dark Funeral. Actually, yes. Um. Because especially that opening, those two huge held chords before. Oh it gets yeah, into- the end of the riff on the beginning of the sample. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, that's a dark funeral technique that they never stopped using. Yeah, and, and the second one has some of that too. Uh, you can hear a lot of connections here. Basically, it's like the eerier and more melodic parts on Panzer Division Marduk. Those oh, yeah. are two or three years after Soren. I'm sure Morgan was listening to them. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, you can hear the relationship between the more sort of strange, wonky Soren chords and the Dark Funeral chords. I mean, I would even say that, especially like that that latter riff, where it's a very like, mm-hmm. it's an early idea of like a prog black metal riff. It, that I'm, crazy spiraling turnaround. Well, I, I was thinking that... Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, I mean, the that, thrashy kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, that's the sort of thing you would hear from, like, uh, like, Fleerity, or, um, hmm. or, uh, fucking, who's the band I always bring up who did, uh, Written in Waters, you know? Oh, oh God, no, it doesn't sound like them. No. Uh, wh- when's the last time you heard that record? Uh, probably, uh, six months ago. Really? Why Ved Buen's you... End. Yeah, Ved Buen's End. No, I, I could definitely see Ved Buen's End doing something like that. Maybe like, with a different production. I like I Written know. in Waters, so, you know, that's not I'm a... I'm gonna <laughs> have to... I'll try it again. I'll try it again. <laughs> the um, the turnaround into it was the most Soren thing they did. That sort of yeah, strange... Yeah. The, the the elaborately shaped kind of otherworld folky thing, like the the strange lead was... And then the sort of downbeat under the thing that you're comparing to Ved Buen's Ed, that big sort of rolling downbeat drums. Um, uh... And so this is a great tour of weird, forgotten Scandinavian music. Yeah, um, marginal late '90s Scandinavian. Exactly. And, and then we got one more. Yeah. What? What? Oh, I was just going to say the the thing that you should call post black metal, but we now <laughs> just mean to say post rock plus black metal or shoegaze plus yeah. black metal. You know. Uh, and then androm till skrak och varnagel let's go to just beginning of the last track also has some just big walled soren chords <laughs> Some more, 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 more,
that second riff is fucking gnarly, right? Are you talking about that ending one? Yeah. Da 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 well, that, that goes back to um, the uh, band that I always talk about, which is uh, Furze. Uh, and also, I mean, and also it's just a death metal riff, right? I mean, there's the, in the Swedish black death equation, right? Yeah. Um, for a band like Soren, often the death metal that's in there is coming from thrashing death metal, like pre-92 yeah. shit. But um, there you get an example Svederna bring out the death metal side of it there, and that could almost be an at the gates riff, right? I mean, I, I'd go further than that. That could almost be like an early, like a deicide bridge, but you would play the deicide mm. tuned way lower with a different production, you know? Dude, that would be a great place in Diablo. Deicide bridge. <laughs> All right, so. The demons uh, don't stop coming. It's on the deicide bridge. Okay, so um, are you are you done reviewing Sorhin yet? I'm satisfied. Yes. Um, All right. So but let's the point talk- being that this band does it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll talk about what you want, but this band does a great <laughs> job of carrying that influence forward and transforming it. You also got a little something the death metal guy would like that sentimental touch, melodic touch on the end of that big Sorhin-y riff. There was not something they would have done. Yeah. No. It's a, that's a very modern idea. Um, so mm-hmm. this is a. This is a weird fucking record, man. <laughs> like, um, yeah, it's it's probably not immediately obvious to people just listening to the samples, but listening to the entire thing together, it is. This is a record which is pulled in a lot of different competing directions, and I think it's good, and I think it's worth revisiting and kind of expanding upon, but. Man, the immediate, like, first listen felt a little disjointed to me. Just because it feels like a band who are trying to incorporate all their favorite things from so many bands, and they're sacrificing some of the body of the music for it. You know what I mean? Not, I don't totally hear that, um, but I think I see what you mean. I think I hear more what you mean now, today, than I did yesterday. For full disclosure for the listeners, I had, uh, I would have, li- I was trying to listen to this on my Bandcamp app while I was doing a lot of walking around last night, and the Bandcamp app was fucked. So I've heard this record in like two or three fragments. Yeah. So I didn't get the full album experience. Um, to me, I think it sounds fairly coherent, just in part because. I listened to a lot of the late 90s Swedish stuff. Soren, yeah. another one would be Ancient's Rebirth. Maybe sounds a little more like this, even because it has a lot more yeah. typical well, black metal in it. No, this is, this is, a, this is a record. What do you hear that's weird in it? Um, perpetually shifting moods and textures and techniques. Mm-hmm. And this is one where I'll say, I'll, I'll give it up. I think this is like a a taste issue. I, I, I am not mm-hmm. going to like sit here and say this is wrong or this is wrong. I think this is just, sure, sure, sure. this is pushing towards a place in black metal that I'm just not really acquainted with. So I'll fully say that my opinions on this record are coming from a blind spot for the style, which I think even you'll admit is a very marginal kind of weird style to draw yeah, ideas yeah. from. And it can be, it can be its own, that can be its own strength, right? So you'll, yeah. you'll point out things I won't notice. Right? Well, additionally, um, if you want, Svedia Land is more of, I listened to a fair amount of that before this too. Svedia Land is more of just the sort of like ballsy, chest thumping, punked out Soren worship record that I kind of yeah. was always waiting to hear. This definitely to me is more introspective and melancholy in places. Yeah. Well, so, it's, um, I think a, uh, well, I'll, I'll get into some of my like yeah. weirder points later, but let me listen to, uh, one of the, uh, samples that I've got. This is not a record with big riffs, I I, I think. Mm-hmm. No, uh, no, no, no. Yeah, it's yeah. It, this does not have climactic moments. These are kind of like studies of a marginal style of Swedish black metal to a degree, but just uh, very very focused on good rhythm riffing. Yeah. So, uh, but this is one of the big moments that I liked, um, and this is off mm-hmm. Nior. So let's try that out real quick. Over and over 
the cool thing about that riff yeah. was that they just kept playing it. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that they vamped on that for a while, and I really like how that, just that dumb, you know, high harmony comes in at the end, which mm-hmm. is, mm-hmm. Uh, because, and it's interesting because you could take this in a couple ways, because it's like, it's kind of Swedish melodic black, and it's kind of Slavic, um, but I would actually go back, f- listening to it again, to a band that we talked about a while back, which is Vindir. Mm, that I, yeah, which is a blind spot for me. So I couldn't tell you, but I my gut is that that makes sense. Well, it's kind of yeah, because the, the Swedish bands that's a big arena moment, and the yeah. arena moments it's like Soren and these other marginal Swedish bands aren't really doing that shit at all, right? But yeah. like, so even the more mainstream Swedish bands like Nilfar are just pure wall of blast beats for the most part. Yeah. Um, that kind of big, big arena breathing room, I could see Windier doing that. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that as far as, like, what we think of as Viking metal, it's, mm-hmm. it's Vindir is, like, the actual root of it for what a lot of the stuff sounds like nowadays. Everyone thinks it's late Bathory. Not really. It's more like Windier. Yeah. Yeah, late Bathory is another one of those things that seems easy to imitate but isn't. Um, It's a... Uh, yeah, it's but, got, you know, a, this it's got its own a, musical vocabulary that's very hard to imitate. Yeah. But, um, you know, yeah, and this is definitely a big, a big sing along with your buddies in the, in the sort of, uh, in the Mead Hall moment. Yeah, um, but, but the, the thing that holds it back from that, which is probably like one of the, like, big issues I have with the record is the production. Um, hmm. this is a, a like given the style of music played here this is an incredibly like dry sort of boxy production on this record like i feel like and it's almost deliberate it feels like they're sucking the reverb out of the music you know what i mean it's like i i I actually go ahead i know exactly what you mean uh that's um it's clearly intentional, so I want to try to spend more some some more time with this record and see if I get it more. Yeah. Um. I. I yeah. There's a thing on the last record, right? Uh, Svedjaland is just sort of bursting with um energy, and it has it. You know, it has the coldness and sharpness in the production that Soren has, but it also has a ringing live quality. Yeah. That is like brings that out even more, and also sort of um. Uh just enlivens it. It's not as sort of um, deliberately inhuman as a... Soren is one of the most inhuman bands ever. Yeah. And this Svedialand is a very sort of human take on that style. Um, and that, to me, I liked the production better. And then when I shifted to this, I almost was like, huh, this is very melancholy. And I think it has something to do with the sa- some of the shapes of the riffs, but also the sound does have this very sort of... It just sounds dark, right? I, like, I mean, um, I don't even know if I would call it dark. I mean, the the big thing that I seize on is like, it's like the like d- dark sound quality, not like you okay. know what I mean. Yeah, I, I get what you mean, but I, for me, the thing I seize on is like, I mean, black metal as a, a standard part of its production arsenal is really into reverb and delay, and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. there's it feels like there's fucking none of that on here. Which is yeah, yeah. very strange. It feels like you're almost listening to like the unmixed version of the record. And like not that any of the levels are wrong, but it's like there's obvious things missing, but I think it's very intentional here. But the the result on the music is it sort of saps some of the atmosphere from it, I think. I, I get what you mean. Yeah, I think that's partly maybe, yeah, there's a, in some sense, the big reverb on the last album gives it a kind of brightness to it, right? Where yeah. it's, uh, there's a, um, this, even if just sort of nocturnal brightness, there's still brightness. This, the cover centered on a bright moon, but it feels much more sort of, um, wandering amidst the dark trees, yeah. if anything. Um, and I think it must connect with the lyrical theme, which is, uh, home but it's a home sort of um it's a home in peril or yeah. there's something there's some distance between you and home i mean did you <laughs> say something about this band like being sort of like eco-focused 
they seem very eco and they seem very rooted in sort of Swedish sweet they really like being Swedish um clearly <laughs> uh and um uh, but they also seem very eco focused um, my guess is that there's some sort of um there's definitely some sort of overarching anti civ vibe yeah. you know you know um I could see them being sort of traditionalists who are very eco-conscious. I could also see them having a background, not so much where they're at now, but I could see them having a background in sort of green anarchist stuff yeah, or okay. anarcho-prim, you know, post-left anarcho-prim yeah. stuff. So, um, well, let me, um, let me get, since I've been kind of like down, uh, let me get into mm-hmm. some of the stuff that I really like on this record and I kind of want them to expand on. So let's listen to uh, a passage off. Uh, let me try this. Uh, Erk Vedslusche, something to that, <laughs> to that mm-hmm. essence. Let's listen to that bit. a big moment uh it, it is but I, it's like i wrote in the notes it was like there's no way you expect me to choose something like this for this record <laughs> the thrash right because you normally hate thrash yeah but that's fucking sick and uh especially the uh i mean that that slide riff is so impressive that da 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 holy yeah fuck. no that's yeah, there's this kind of mid-tempo thrashing part, which is cool. I, I like parts like that. That connects to a little bit to the crypto thrash part of Soren. But, um, and then just this, yeah, this fucking breakdown. Yeah. Thrash there, metal break- it's a, you said, it's a thrash what did you say breakdown. about Exodus? I, I said it's the, like the best riff that Exodus never made. Although it's not yeah. actually Exodus. It's like, um, I mean, it's comparable in a way to like an early Slayer breakdown. Like the Angel yeah, of Death kinda- breakdown. Yeah. It's very hardcore too. Yeah, it's thrash yeah. hardcore. Um, but, but but and the, then there's the, the. Oh, go ahead. What do you want to talk about? Yeah. Oh, I was just going to get into like the related sample. But if you have something to say, yes. go ahead. No, no, go, and then I'll talk about just okay. Before the related sample, I'll just say the blast, yeah. the turnaround of the blasting at the end. I made the death metal guy keep rolling it because that's just there. We are back into the. You know what they do? They're doing the build to the riff where you think they're going to play the riff once or twice before the drop, and the blasts yeah. start most of the way into the second rep and then it hits after the blasts have already kicked which is yeah these guys are great musicians right yeah. um but anyway let's go to your sample so i um so this is sort of, this is some shit that i'm like uniquely passionate about which is like sort of bbh adjacent and i know that we've probably uh-huh. discussed them periodically but have you ever like really listened to dub buck not at all, no. Yeah, mm. Dub Buck it's, uh, fucking rules. I, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what, I've seen, there's that Hate Forest, um, you know, there's that uh, live footage of that one time Hate Forest played live or whatever at this massive Ukrainian, uh, this very NS massive Ukrainian festival. Yeah. Um, and well, uh, Was it, was it like an Oscar be- try or something? Or? No way before that. This oh, is, okay. um, but, um, uh, Dub Book was this is young all these this is hate for us ninety nine but Dub Book oh, was there yeah. and the guy looks like a teenager and he he sort of uh he whips the crowd up like a dictator and then 
the record starts and it's just like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh god, it's um, uh, but um, so, so, I've, so that's, that's what your dub book experience. Uh, well, yes. First of all, dub yeah, let's say it was that it was blue balled. Dub um, book <laughs> fucking rules, and uh, I actually have a passage that's just if you can remember this last passage off uh, Urkovitz Juliet. Um, it's, that's my attempt at pronouncing it. Um, you're going to hear shit that's radically similar on this passage. So this is off uh, De Book's final record, which was uh, Rus Ponad Vousse, uh, which is uh, Rus Above All. And uh, let's, just, uh, <laughs> let's just try this yeah, section out and, and tell me if this sounds similar to you. I hear what you mean, yeah. So, one, I would like to tell everybody, that's fucking sick. (laughs) And two, uh, yeah, it's got this, like, weirdly bouncy quality that I hear on a lot of the Svederna. Um, like, Archaic thrash. Yeah, well, to be fair, like, to, like, elucidate it to the audience, um... Dubuck is not always like this. That's on their last couple records. They started really pushing this sort of like Slavic thrash idea, which is, <laughs> which I, uh, you know, I, I will fully say I fucking hate thrash, but when they do it, they pull it off, especially with like those synth melodies kind of encroaching on yeah. the territory and just like the cool rhythmic ideas that aren't so obsessed with the thrash beat, you know? But I, yeah, no, they're not, and they're not just sitting on palm mutes. He's not just doing like, uh, there's a version of this. They're really focusing on the kind of mid tempo thrash riffs that people often hate. And the, um, the mid tempo thrash Svederna, riffs that, that people forget about that are not important yeah, yeah. to the album. Yeah. The things that are like two steps, basically. Yeah. And Sv- Svederna's got a lot of that. Sorin has a lot of that. Um, this is, um, and they use that sort of punctuated rhythm of the mid-tempo thrash riff to make, they use it well with the kind of folk, the depth of melody you get from folk to make yeah. these kinds of um, bouncing, weirdly pogo-y kind of beer hall melodies, right? Um, yeah. That have a lot of sort of nuance in them, as simple as some of the riffing seems to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that seems right. Um... And I wanted to close out something a little closer to that to also get at this sort of crypto thrash side of Svaderna, um, yeah. which is uh, just from Temple Hard. And also, again, this kind of beer hall, this Schlager music vibe yeah. almost comes out in this. There's a very sort of, um, this is also, again, very punky, and it's very sort of, uh, despite the muted production, very kind of shout along with your bros. All right, um, well, let's give that a try.
Yeah. No, there's some... I, I feel like that That kind blast, of, they turn it around into that blast at the end. Man. That blast at the end is really cool. But I would say a lot of that, like, almost um, kind of reinforces my, like, debuck, like, modernized mm-hmm. Black Thrash idea. I picked it for you, bud. <laughs> um, I was a... Uh, no, I, I mean, I yeah, no, for sure. There's that Black th- sort of... <laughs> black Thrash that's actually good. <laughs> As opposed to <laughs> just listening to Ara Noir forever, you know? Oh God! Uh, <laughs> uh, but that, and that we were talking about. There's that Schlager riff at the beginning, which they almost they repeat longer than any other band would do it. But yeah, the point is to run around in a circle pit and shout. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, it's a uh, very it's yeah Swedish or German that really could be a horn riff, right? Especially like the new yeah. speedy version of horn. Um. Uh. Yeah, this band is cool. There's a lot. Of, I agree. There's a lot of range on this album. I agree. I'd like a different production. Um, yeah, I think that's my big sticking point. Is I feel like maybe some of these like super diverse ideas could be bound together with, with, with you know, because you do this very. When I hear something with a very flat production like this, that's that's mm-hmm. a statement, you know. And I hear that a lot with certain kinds of death metal bands where it's like. Mm-hmm. here are our riffs as you would say you will listen to mm-hmm. them and you will judge them accordingly but that's very strange to me on a record like this which is pulling from these very kind of melodically dramatic ideas mm-hmm. but there's not the production to and, reinforce them it's very strange to and me. it's and it's aiming to integrate these different parts into a whole sort of I think all these parts do and can go together, right? It's aiming yeah, to integrate all yeah. these different... It's aiming for full-spectrum black metal in the way that the Norse and the Swedes did, and virtually nobody except one-off bands has accomplished since yeah. then. Um, and I think as far as the formula of the sound and the riff writing, they really do accomplish that. But I agree, a different production... Maybe a return to a bit more of the swaggering live style of the last one could help with that. Which, yeah, does that seem reasonable? Yeah, I think there's a sense of... I appreciate the confidence of what they're doing here, but I guess I just take mm-hmm. issue with, like... It, it feels like the confidence is almost resulting in, fuck it, no reverb, no delay, no, no fucking production trickery. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Here are our riffs, here is our expression of Swedish black metal, and I respect that... But you're leaving a lot on the table when you do that. You know what I mean? You're you're leaving I, I, no. you're leaving a whole paradigm of your expression on the table when you decide to do that. I I, I think I agree, and you know, I mean, uh, I think, and it's uh, yeah, no, I th- I, th- I think that's right. I think more um, everything else about it is so. You know, they could write the Here Are Our Riffs album, but it would be a riff, an album that just sounded like, um, you know, these guys, Soren's second album is also worth talking about at some point, and I think shows up on here in some places mm-hmm. in the weirdest riffs, which is Apocalypse and Angel, but it sounds more urban, basically, oh, yeah. and very proto DSO and stuff. Like, uh, but, um, this band could write a whole album of just these sort of, jaw-dropping weirdo sort of um swedish uh folk sci-fi riffs <laughs> but um they they they're not doing that here they're aiming at this more comprehensive thing so i would i really think these guys are great i'm gonna go back and get you know uh get the last one as well yeah. uh Svediland. and um I, w- I hope that we hear more from this band i'd like to support them on the show and we would love to hear you guys go more balls out on the next one. And yeah, also, no, I, we didn't even mention it, but the vocals are fantastic. The vocals are very good. I I, I guess I would say uh, I'm very intrigued by this band. Um, mm-hmm. I- enough so that, th- that listening to this album the first time was such a weird experience with just how divergent it is. It's, it's not something I immediately love, but I feel compelled to go back to it and try to kind of like excavate it. You know what I mean? That's Which, cool. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. And I appreciate a record that will compel me to do that. You know, as much as I like music, which is just like super upfront and 
sort of monodimensional in a good way. I appreciate a record that suggests like, oh, go back, let's listen again, and let's kind of search for the thread in this music, which I don't think I've discovered yet. Yeah, and I think I feel the stylistic thread, but I kind of, I literally heard it in fragments, and so I, and I agree with what you're saying about there needs to, there's some integration that could happen here, and, but there's also hidden depths, so I'd like to go back and listen to that. Definitely. Mm. So, uh, okay. I think that brings us to the end. Um, to, uh, wrap it up, I would suggest that you uh, all you sick YouTube gamers, please smash that like button, subscribe, and comment <laughs> on your favorite weird marginal Swedish black metal album. <laughs> and, yeah, that and, would be a good thread. And, um, and while you're at it, check us out on Patreon or Subscribestar. Give us your money. Because, I mean, you work hard for it, so obviously you should donate it to a couple of weirdos talking about marginal black metal. You know, that makes sense, right? <laughs> Please do. You know, honestly, there are probably only 10 marginal Swedish black metal albums, so what I would recommend is favorite song off one of them. That'd be cool. Oh, definitely. Comment. Um, Along with your Patreon or subscribe star donation, send us a message stating your favorite marginal Swedish black metal record, and, uh, you know, maybe we'll cover it. (laughs) And and follow us on, um, you know, uh, yeah, you can also get in touch on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, You can message me on Instagram, and I'll actually talk to you. Um, yeah, we we don't so, have lives. It's cool. Message me on Facebook, yeah. and I'll I'll probably just send you a picture of one of my cats. But you know, I'll I'll respond. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. all right. So for an outro, why don't we leave them with um? I had this kind of mark. I uh, let's go with the Soren song. I don't think Soren's yeah, not going to sue us. <laughs> um, so uh, Soren don't give a fuck about anything. They just recorded two brilliant flawless albums and then just laid it they were like okay we're done now yeah i'm gonna go make bizarre martial industrial <laughs> <laughs> it's uh um uh and one of them actually formed arcanum um, oh okay yeah uh but uh so what's see, sore so, yeah, song? yeah i'm gonna I'm gonna pick it now let's go with um let's give them a more blasty one but also a pretty one i'm just going for the big hits here yeah. uh, let's go for uh the big sore hit hits Grif- that don't exist <laughs> yeah let's go for Skog's grifton's rika which was their uh first um uh which i think is something like wood sorrows realm as opposed to you know remember else this thing um and uh, this was that was the title also of their first ep but uh let's oh, just okay. play this one All right, right. that'll do it, and uh, we'll talk to you guys next week.